Welcome to the Digging Deep ATVMX Podcast with your host, hailing from Kakana, Wisconsin, riding a CST Tires SSI decals traveling back Yamaha YFC 450R, four-time ATV Motocross National Champion, number 25. Cody Jensen. What's up, everybody? We're, We're back. back. I'm your host, Cody Jansen. Welcome to episode 87 of the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast, presented by our title sponsor, CST Tires, in stock and available for purchase today at shop.csttires.com. This is our Briarcliff Review Show, starring track owner Jeremy Osborne, pro class podium finisher Max Linquist. Pro-Am and Pro-Sport overall winner Aaron Salinas, and Impact Solutions' Casey Greek will join us to help break down all the action from Ohio right here on the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. Before dropping the gate on another race review podcast, shout out to all of our incredible partners. CST Tires, go to shop.csttires.com today. Yamaha, thanks to Blue Crew. Thanks to SSI Decals, DID Racing Chain, Namira Technologies, Bronco ATV and UTV Components, Impact Solutions, Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply, the financial advice of the Haymower Financial Group, Forworks Carbon, DP Brakes, Factory 43, Integrative Financial Concepts and their Safe to Race and Safe to Ride Insurance programs, Binky's Forever ATC Museum, Blenzall Oil, the official oil choice of Digging Deep, Evans Waterless Power Sports Coolant, Walsh Racecraft, and Manscaped. Get 20% off and free shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. Manscaped's signature line, the Performance Package 4.0, includes the new Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer that I rely on to help keep my beard on point, the best nose hair trimmer ever created, and an array of goodies like deodorant, boxer briefs, a travel bag, and more. So check out Manscaped, I wish I would have sooner, and get 20% off with free shipping by using code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. So rad that Manscaped is investing in ATV Racing as a longtime partner of Digging Deep. Help us keep them in the fold and involved in ATV Racing by using our Digging Deep 20 code so they know you enjoy Digging Deep and what we're all about here. Support these great companies that support us, and for any products that fall through the cracks, click that Rocky Mountain ATVMC banner on our website to help us out. The 2022 season is here, but we both know you still need parts and gear. No matter what off-road gear parts you need, Rocky Mountain ATVMC has you covered. But before you buy, simply click that Rocky Mountain ATVMC banner on our website. By using our specific link, we get a percentage of what you buy on the back end, enabling you to help us out while purchasing the parts you need anyway. And did you know that you can buy OEM parts from Rocky Mountain ATVMC as well? Yep. Ship conveniently right to your door. I've been using this over and over and over again on my Blue Crew YFZ450R build, so you should too. Click that Rocky Mountain ATVMC banner at diggingdeepatvmx.com to help us out while satisfying all your gear and parts needs. And you can do the same with our Amazon widget. So same concept, simply click that Amazon logo on our homepage, purchase whatever your heart desires, and that will help us out down the road. We can't thank you enough for that. No new donors to shout out this week, but if you are interested in donating and hearing your name on the show, you can find the Patreon or Buy Me A Coffee donation links on our website. Major thanks to all who have donated. You guys freaking rock. Now, it's showtime. The 30-second board is up, it's sideways, and the gate is down. Time to dig deep. Let's go. All right, guys, we saw some incredible racing at Briarcliff this past weekend, so I've been anxiously awaiting this discussion here tonight. Joining me to help break down everything that happened in Ohio is a man that is just two points and two positions ahead of me in digging deep ATVMX fantasy as we speak. Brought to you by Evans Waterless Power Sports Coolant. Upgrade to Evans now to avoid overheating and boil over next time you hit the track or trail. Use discount code DIGGINGDEEP20 at checkout to save at evanscoolant.com. From Impact Solutions, say hello to Mr. Casey Greek. What's up, Casey? I'm closing the gap in ATVMX Fantasy, Casey. I'm making up ground. Hey, Cody. Thanks for having me back. Um, yeah, I'm losing ground by the race. I don't know. Um, I've kind of just almost picked pretty much the same team all year. And it's I'm going backwards, um, so I've got to get some good motos in here in the next few races so I can get myself back up in that top 20. 
Hey, thank God I didn't have Brandon this past weekend because I think uh, I think that buried about 80 teams from what I can calculate. Uh, so thankfully, thankfully that wasn't me. But uh, man, we we saw some great racing in Ohio. How awesome is Briarcliff, Casey? A track truly built by ATB racers for ATB racers. It doesn't get much better than that. It's a awesome venue. So glad that the series is back going to Briarcliff. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that's you know. It was exciting to be there and exciting, you know, it's, it's close for us, for the shop. And, um, I just, I really enjoy the place. I enjoy the people. I just feel like, you know, we're so welcome there. And that kind of is my impact moment of the day is, you know, I wanted to talk about, you know, the, the job the track crew does there, you know, Jeremy, and then, you know, having this press day where, you know, we got to go to this really nice golf course and he had it. Like, you know, it wasn't full catered, like, dinner and all that stuff, but there was, you know, appetizers and drinks and a really nice, like, banquet hall, like, to hang out in while you're waiting your turn to go in for your press day. And I just think that's huge. Um, it really shows what he's willing to do for us, and, and that's the, the positive side of what he's bringing to our sport that we love so much. Absolutely. I mean, last year when he came on the show, he talked about it being his Super Bowl, right? And you can really tell that he goes the extra mile. I think it's a it's it's kind of a perfect story of he got the opportunity to host a national in 2014 and waited seven long years to get that opportunity again and made the most of it last year and now is just doing it bigger and better this year. So I would have to believe, especially being in the Ohio Mecca that is, you know, for ATV motocross, there's a lot of guys that come from that area. I would think that Briarcliff will be on the schedule for long into the future. So Let's do this. Let's jump right into our conversation with track owner Jeremy Osborne. I think this is the perfect time for it, as you just mentioned it there. And uh, we'll talk about the weekend and the weekend that he calls his Super Bowl. And then we'll come back and get into the racing action. So stay tuned. All right, guys, stoked to talk to this guy right out of the gate on this Briarcliff Review episode brought to you by Blenzol, the oil choice of the Digging Deep ATBMX podcast. To learn more about Blenzol's rich history or to shop Blenzol's full line of racing lubricants, visit Blenzol.com and follow Blenzol on Instagram. Joining us after hosting an ATB National for the third time, it's my honor to introduce the owner of Briarcliff himself, Mr. Jeremy Osborne. Sir, welcome back to Digging Deep and congrats on being awarded another ATB Motocross National at Briarcliff, what you called your Super Bowl last time you joined us here on Digging Deep. Yeah, thank you for having me back on. It was uh, it was a great event. We it, it really, I think it went pretty well. We you know little glitches obviously, but um, we're very proud of that event. Um, we'll keep trying to build it and make it better each year. And we're just super appreciative that the riders are choosing to come back to Briarcliff. Oh, hell yeah. I think people love going there. And I've heard nothing but good things about the event since the weekend, Jeremy. I'm hearing that you know, track prep was men and promotion was killer, like always. Fun activities like you guys always put together. And overall, just an awesome event. You go the extra mile and it shows, buddy. It really does. Well, thank you. We, uh, we definitely uh, try to do 100%. Uh, I make notes of things that I don't feel like went well, and I try to work on them. Uh, one of these days, we're going to put a cell tower up out there <laughs> because that, uh, there's a few things we, we cannot control to, to a certain point. But the, the things we can control, we, we focus on those. And uh, the, the little off-track things, I, I absolutely love Saturday night. That The, the pit quad stuff everybody just loves that and it's it brings a smile to my face to kind of to bring that to them and everybody has so much fun it's awesome exactly i mean there's so much pressure of the races i think that those activities like that you know just make it so much more of an experience and actually that's what you said to us last year right is that kind of stuck with me the fact that you try to make it an experience a true event than just a race, right? Like that's something that's a main focus for you. And I think that that really shows, I think that that's why, you know, Briarcliff is such, it's becoming a favorite for people because you just make it an experience, a true experience for these families. Yeah. And we, and, and that's, I've, I've focused on that a while back when we started running races again at my facility in 2012. Um, you know, and obviously I picked up on that from going to races myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you just don't want to go to a race. You want to go to an event and the, an event involves a lot of dynamics, a lot of different factors. 
and it, it, you don't always hit it, but you try and you try to make things just a little more fun. You know, you still have your seriousness. You still have the racing. You still have the, the normal stuff, but mm-hmm. add in the little, the little fun one-off things mm-hmm. and make it something that people uh, want to come back and do again, you know? Exactly. I think that that, uh, I think that that is just something that these families enjoy so much and, and really look forward to. And I think that that was reflected in the numbers, right? I heard the numbers were really big. How big were they? Give us a little update on that. Well, I had, uh, you know, I have these periods or spells when I'm on the radio because uh-huh. you hear so much radio chatter. I could have sworn I heard a number uh, Saturday morning, but I, I was wrong. I posted it and it was wrong. It was the actual number of entries was 631. Okay. After we, we had some, uh, some refunds prior to practice and some people that couldn't make it, we kind of, it would have been uh, somewhere around 638 or something, but 631, which is about 51, 49 or something higher than our first race in 14, our first oh, wow. national. So it's, it's a big race. A lot of people, tons of spectators like we normally get. I, mm-hmm. I designated about two acres of parking under the power lines where people don't really want to park their rigs anyway. Okay. Uh, for spectator parking, and I probably could have done about double. Um, oh, really? Okay. Awesome. I, I, I think I could add about 10 acres of parking, and I still wouldn't feel like we are swimming in parking. It, it just it never ends. We, we, I don't think we could have enough parking ever. That's all. That's awesome, though. And that that stuck with me last year, Jeremy, was seeing the photos of all the spectators, which is so cool. And, you know, that area, the Ohio area is such a mecca for for quads, It's such a hotbed for quads. And I think that, you know, just having a race at Briarcliff and all the fans, all the people love it. I think that that's just the it's the perfect location for people to come and watch it. And I don't know, maybe you can touch on this, what promotion you do. But man, like people come out in droves for this event. And I think obviously that bodes well going forward for you know to to expect Briarcliff nationals atv nationals year after year here going forward well we we do uh a few different levels of promotion uh the easiest one social media mm-hmm. uh it don't cost hardly anything to do social media posts and uh make uh, flyers up and post those and then we also actually print our uh, atv series poster I printed off a couple hundred of those things and I just started giving them the people around the state, different places. I give them some wristbands. I'd say, Hey, get these up, put these somewhere. Use the wristbands to, to encourage people to put them up. Mm -hmm. Um, We do that. We do radio ads. So my local radio station reaches about an hour around the track. So we did radio ads for about a week and a half with the radio station um yeah it it, i don't know just that to me seems like a good formula we've we've used that a couple times now and that seems to work well with the the atv off-road community that we have and Mm -hmm. uh i i i don't know i guess it's it seems kind of simple to me it it does but it does. It does. But doesn't it go a long way though? Cause we, you know, for years there's been these topics and these talks of, you know, we go to these tracks and it seems like there's no promotion for the event. Right. So all you have is the, the people that come to each and every ATV national and not that I'm trying to slight anybody, but I feel like, like you said, like it's kind of these typical, you know, easy things, but I think it does go a long way. Like look at the crowd, look at all the people that came out for this event. And, and again, that right. kind of goes back to what I'm getting at is that you go the extra mile. It's not rocket science, but you go the extra mile and it, and it truly seems to show. No, but at the same time, I've got that crowd to, yeah. to, to solicit. I mean, some of these places we go, they're just, and this doesn't mean don't go racing there, but they don't necessarily have the enthusiasts that I have. I'm, I'm pretty lucky. My location is very good. Yes. Um, so for me to market, it makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's other areas, you know, where even if they did do what I had done, I don't know that they would get the crowd I got because they're just not in a great location for ATV enthusiast. Well, and, and um, that's why going going back to what I had said earlier too, Jeremy, is 
Like, that's why it makes so much sense to have a race in Ohio. I mean, there were so many years there without a race in Ohio. It was like, man, what are we doing? So many people come from over there. Yeah. It just makes, it makes perfect sense to, 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 to have an event at your facility. It really does. Especially, you know, you're an ATV guy. Like, like I remember this conversation you and I had last year, but man, like we want to go to places where they want us, like where the promoter is, you know, at least pro ATV, you know, likes ATVs. Right. Well, you love ATVs. So it just, it makes yeah. perfect, perfect sense. Yeah, no, I it, definitely, um, it does make sense. I think we have a pretty good schedule this year, to we be do. honest. We do. Yes. We um, do. I can't, I can't think of too many rounds where I, I, I cringe to go to or anything like that. Actually, I don't cringe at any of them, to be honest. <laughs> right. I, I think they're all pretty good. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I guess more, more Jeremy, I'm referencing years past, you know, like, yeah. like maybe in that 2013, 14 area. I mean, there was, there was clearly, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying anything that hasn't been said before that we were going right. to tracks that didn't want to have us, you know, right. um, in, in big yeah. name tracks that were uh, check off the bucket list that we got to race there, but it wasn't yeah. the greatest experience. And, you know, going to Briarcliff again, I would have a 10 round series at Briarcliff if, if, <laughs> if you know what I mean? Like, like to go to places that want to have us is meaningful to me. I've always believed that. And, and again, like you said, schedule is great this year. Love it. I think we are going to a lot of great places, but I I'm glad that we're kind of, um, you know, focusing on going to places that truly want to have us that enjoy the ATVs and, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of a priority for these places to have us. And, and I, I truly think that you're a part of that charge. I really do. T totally agree. Thank you for, for saying that. Um, yeah, no, I, that's a, that's a key, that's a key ingredient. You know, if, if the people do not want to host the event, truly in their heart, do not want to host the event, then you're setting yourself up for a little bit of failure, I feel. Um, then what are we doing? You know, right. You know, you, you, you gotta, you gotta want to, you gotta want the crowd to be there in order to host the crowd correctly, because if things start to go bad with the weather, like that never happens. Um, <laughs> then it makes it a real uphill battle. If you truly don't want the crowd there, it makes it really tough, uh, to, to get through it without having issues. Um, so having the crowd there, it definitely helps you refocus when you're in the trenches and, and you're just trying to fix whatever needs fixed. And uh, when, when things are coming at you fast, mm -hmm. So um, we talked last year about, you know, the changes, improvements and all the stuff that you basically like made note of, made lists of, made mental notes of all the stuff you wanted to do differently in the seven years that you waited for your second opportunity at an ATV national. So what improvements did you make from last year to this year? Was there anything, you know, yeah. notable stuff? What comes to mind there? What, what did you change? Uh, right, right off the rip, we added all the, we added a lot of infield fencing. I wanted it to make, have a, have a bigger uh, feel to the infield. So we put up all new fence and we extended it clear down uh, near the first turn of the start so people could be near the first turn to do photographs and, and videos. And they could uh, also view kind of the Bigfoot triple from, from the bottom, which is much more impressive. We did that and we added uh, a little bit more parking there where the little kids track, it still is there, but I'm planning on taking that out and making that all parking. So we added a little parking Okay. Um, put stone in where e score sits and the vendor food vendor sit. Um, change the track. I tried to slow it down some. The pro guys like to prove me wrong. They, <laughs> they, uh, they, they. It's like a chess game with those guys. Right. It's a lot of fun. I'm having fun doing it. But they, uh, they're, they're crafty dudes. So yeah, that's true. We do. We changed, we added uh, some, some sawdust and sand in sections to kind of make it a little break up a little more. Um, I don't think it really affected lap times that much. I think I'm down to just, I'm going to have to add a pro section. Um, mm. So I think that's going to be a focus in mind for next year. Jeremy, those guys see things differently than you and I see things. Oh yeah. I, we, we had a, a school, the Team USA school, Yep. On Thursday, which seemed like a lifetime ago yesterday, <laughs> but I, during that school, I picked their brains and, uh, yeah, there's, they, they just, uh, yeah, 
it's like, okay, I'll do this. And they're like, all right, well, we'll do this. And then you just <laughs> back and forth, change things until you, I guess I got to, and, and the hard part is it's just not all about the pros. I mean, you, you want them to be happy, but you also got a ton of amateurs that have to race the track too. Right. So it's, it's a balancing act and it, it's very tough uh, to balance uh, CVT seventies, nineties and four fifties and then amateurs and pros and pro-ams and it, so you, you got to just kind of know in your heart that you're doing the right thing for the better of the group and not just mm -hmm. the, the 16 or so fastest ATV racers on the planet. Exactly. You know what, Jeremy, I think that, uh, I think you did a, a hell of a job. I think just about everybody would agree with me. Um, man, awesome racing all weekend. Awesome, awesome place that you have. And, uh, man, just can't wait to, uh, continue to go to your race in the future here. So, uh, before we get you out of here, uh, can we talk about WMX for a second? Your daughter, Kinsey Osborne. Yeah put the ATV racing world on notice at the season opener and has never looked back Four overall wins since then for the rookie back-to-back -back wins after another W this past weekend. And the title is coming into focus now, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, if my math is correct and I, I looked at this like 20 million times, <laughs> sure. Cause I didn't want to be wrong, yeah. but I believe we might be one win away. If I'm doing my drops right and everything, Okay. Um, but that, that we're not, I'm, we're not focused on that. We, we, we gotta, we gotta just, we got pull hole shots, run clean laps. And if it happens, it happens. Well, she's you know? been, she, dude, she's been on an absolute tear. So getting hole shots and running clean laps is what she's been doing. Like it's her job. Um, I have to believe, obviously I know this, I mean, you're a proud papa, but is this what you expected? Like, did you expect it to go this way? Because she just, I mean, she told us when we talked to her after the opener, when she joined the show here, she talked about how she looks up to people like Andrea and, yeah. and Neve and, and now look at what she's doing. I mean, she, I know she still probably looks up to those girls. I mean, they've been, you know, the, the picture of consistency in the WMX class for years now, but she's went basically right to the top and been right. the one to beat. And that's just been so fun to watch. I mean, she's such a great rider and such a great, you know, person, seem, seemingly such a great person. And man, it's just awesome to see. It's one of those people that I really enjoy cheering for. She is. I mean, yes and no. I mean, there, there was part of me in the back of my head that thought, wow, you know, what if she just goes two steps and, and really, and really just hones in on what she needs to do to go fast on the 450? Maybe. I, I thought, you know, there's a chance. You always think there's a chance. Of course. Yeah. But to, to what, honestly the way it's played out no uh i i <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit more of a realist i i would have thought a couple wins shock them at tracks that she's really good at like yep. like she's pretty good at sunset and obviously at our track yep um but i did not think it would be i don't want to necessarily use the word dominant at times but it, it seems like she's in control at times yeah. and and just solidly in control and I, and I did not expect that I, I did not expect that at all it's been be so honest. it's been so fun to watch it was that high point I believe when uh when I listened to Rodney you know say that she's on her way to being one of the greats and I had to I had to agree with him right like some of the stuff that we've yeah. seen right from the rip because this is the thing is and you know this because you you guys you've been a part of this all the great phenomenal promotion of the WMX class and all the great things that you guys are doing. I think I've talked on a lot of these shows about all the great stuff you guys are doing. And I'd love to see that. And these girls deserve that. But the quality of the WMX class is really good. Like, especially that, you know, yeah. that top three that Kinsey is now a part of, they're yeah. slaying it. And for her to jump in there and do as well as she's done has been awesome to see, but the quality of the class is great. And then everything that you guys are doing, Jeremy, to, to promote that class going forward and the girls 15 plus class and, and those younger classes, school girl, all that stuff. I mean, we talk about it all the time, but all of that is just going to continue to make the WMX class better and better because you guys are playing planting seeds that are going to be fruitful right. for years to come. And I love to see that. I think once uh, Natalie Jackson and um, uh, Livy Joyner and Plaza, um, Plaza, Lillian Plaza for sure. She, she looks like 
uh, I guess if there is a, a Kinsey in making or whatever, she, she's better than that. She, uh, she's really fast. Um, and Natalie is super fast. Natalie's doing things on her 250 that Kinsey didn't necessarily do on a 250. Sure. I mean, she, she looks good. And uh, I think once those girls graduate and get to when they're 16 and get a run WMX, yep. look out. You're going to, I mean, and if we still have a current lineup that we have mixed mm -hmm. in with that, it's going to be over the top there. It's going to be almost like the old days of pro-am in a way, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to have that level of anticipation, like who's going to grab the whole shot, who, who's going to run out front, who's going to challenge and it. It, it's it's cool it's cool to see that it could potentially get to that point I, I love it I really do I think you know I've talked myself blue in the face about I I hated when the those younger up-and-coming girls didn't have something to necessarily look forward to and the building up of these classes has completely flipped that 180 so I absolutely love that and it's awesome like uh, that riders like Kinsey and, and Natalie Jackson, these girls up and coming have that to look forward to. And that's, you know, thanks to you guys. And, um, you know, Andrea Berger has been at the front of that pack and, and, you know, just doing all that she can and, and like you have to, to, to make that class and those classes uh, the best that they can be. So I'd love to see that. I think probably the most impressive thing I saw from her, one of them, not maybe not the most, but okay. it was super impressive uh, Sunday in 450B. She had, a, you know, obviously she had kind of a bad first moto, got, got off the track in the first turn and had to come from last up to a qualifying position. Mm -hmm. And then in the second moto, she was all the way outside, which isn't necessarily the best gate pick in the world at my place. Right. And she somehow weaseled her way into about a sixth, seventh place start on a full gate and then pushed to fourth mm -hmm. and then was pressuring the heck out of, I think it was Braden Orr for third. Okay. And just to see her running, running with him and, and running kind of with that front pack in, in 450B, mm -hmm. first time ever in the class, she looked like she belonged. And that, that was that was pretty special uh, to see. I mean, yeah. honestly, yeah, she, yeah. Uh, it, it was pretty cool. I liked yeah. it. I think so too. When I saw that as well, I was like, man, like she, she is on it. And to think that this is her first year racing a 450. I mean, to think that this is the baseline, uh, just right. awesome to think about what this could be going forward. So I love yeah, to see I, it. I think back to my first <laughs> year on a 450. And I wasn't nowhere near <laughs> that fast. Um, and to think of, I know personally how much faster I got as I learned things through the years. Right. And I, I think that may be the case with her. It's, it's kind of exciting to think about where she could go if she, mm -hmm. if she stays focused with it and uh, keeps pushing. So it's, it's, it's cool. It's cool to see. Yeah. It's going to be so much fun to watch. I love it. Well, I uh, wanted to get you on here, Jeremy, for a quick chat to, to kick off this episode. Um, like I've been saying, I can't thank you enough for being such an incredible host of the series and an event and a facility truly built by ATB racers for ATB racers. And thank you so much uh, for all you do for the sport as well. We touched on the WMX stuff, but I uh, just can't thank you enough. Your efforts don't go unnoticed. And uh, we all, on behalf of the entire ATV racing community, we can't thank you enough for that. And uh, really, really, really looking forward to next year, pal. Awesome, dude. Appreciate it. Love everybody coming out. It was a good event. Uh, look forward to next year. You're the man, Jeremy. Congrats again. Good luck to Kinsey and the fam down the stretch here. And we'll see you soon, all right? Thank you. That's Jeremy Osborne, owner of Briarcliff himself, right here on the Digging Deep ATMX podcast, brought to you by Blenzall. Thank you, sir. We'll get right back to the show, but now a word from our sponsors. And thank you for listening to these ads. Without these great companies, none of this would be possible. Show your support for the people who support us. We used to speak of a CST takeover, but now 2022 is the year of CST supremacy. CST's Pulse MXR tires are the choice of Joel Hetrick, Jeffrey Rastrelli, and Nick Janusa, meaning CST tire riders are in contention for pro class wins and a possible podium sweep every time they hit the racetrack. CST tires are also the official tire choice of the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast, but you already knew that. I, your host Cody Jansen, helped pioneer the CSD takeover with Pulse MXR fronts and white label soft compound rears on my way to back-to-back -to -back national championships and a pro sport podium to cap off the 2021 season. 
The Pulse MXR tire, available in soft and standard compounds, offer the highest level of traction, most predictable cornering, and superior wear characteristics when compared to the competition. Did I mention they offer contingency payouts as well? Visit shop.csd tires to join the CSD takeover today or prepare to be beat by someone who did. Joel Hattrick, Jeffrey Rastrelli, Nick Janusa, myself, and so many more believe and trust in CSD tires. Do you? You already know we're Team Blue Crew now more than ever here at the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. And whether it's eight time and reigning ATVMX Pro Class National Champion Chad Weenan, who with his next championship will become the winningest champion in ATV motocross history, or seven time and current XC1 Pro ATV GNCC National Champion Walker Fowler, who is now tied for second all time in titles one, it's clear the podium proven Yamaha YFZ 450R is the winning choice of sport ATVs. This continued and unprecedented success for the Yamaha YFZ 450R, its unrivaled quality and performance, and the undisputable fact that Yamaha is the leading OEM supporter of ATV racing has resulted in an ever-growing Yamaha takeover within the sport quad market. Best yet, Yamaha's Blue Crew Racer Support Program is back and stronger than ever here in 2022, meaning Yamaha riders will once again cash in on payouts and prize opportunities, including a chance to win a brand new YFZ 450R. For more info, head over to YamahaBlueCrew.com, follow them at Yamaha Outdoors on social media, and check out Yamaha's full proven off-road lineup at YamahaOutdoors.com today. SSI Decals is a name synonymous with ATV racing, synonymous with big-time success, and absolutely synonymous with the best-looking decals around. An offshoot of their parent company that was established in 1947, SSI first took shape from owner Ian Harris's passion for ATVs. With what started as just making numbers and decals for riders like Chad Weenan, the company quickly took off, and today you couldn't imagine ATV motocross without SSI decals. The graphics maker and designer now supports all the top teams in ATV motocross, as well as teams and riders racing GNCC, Work Series, Pro Motocross and Supercross, Canadian Pro Motocross, Short Course Off-Road Trucks, UTVs, Snowcross, and, oh yeah, six-time world champion top fuel drag racer Clay Milliken. No project is too big or too small for SSI decals, making your identity stick with championship-level graphics. Head over to SSIDecals.com today and then maybe call the doctor because things are about to get sick. The Digging Deep ATVMX podcast is brought to you in part by DID and their wide range of championship-winning chains. From the street to the track and everywhere in between, DID chains are designed to give you the optimal riding experience with great performance and increased chain life. Consistent to the core, pick up your box of reliability today. DID, what drives you? We are proud to be partnered with Numira Technologies. Since 2001, Numira has led the charge in the ATV and side-by-side market, covering more applications than anyone else in the industry. Numira's advanced piston technology uses a NASA-exclusive aluminum alloy that helps to reduce expansion rates, allows for tighter tolerances, and leads to higher overall engine performance for your machine. For more information about Numira's wide offerings of pistons, rings, gaskets, industry-leading top-end repair kits, and recently added connecting rods, visit your local dealer or online at www.numira.com. Namira Technologies, your one-stop shop, engine, component, supplier. We are pleased to be partnered with Bronco ATV and UTV Components. Bronco has been an industry leader in replacement hard parts and accessories for all makes and models for over 15 years. With a catalog that includes a full line of electrical components, engine internals and cylinders, shock and suspension parts, winches, clutch kits, valves, carb kits, bearing kits, and drive chain parts, Bronco is your hard part source for whatever you need for whatever you ride. Available exclusively through distributors around the world, visit your local dealer or online at broncoatv.com. Forworks Carbon's innovative lightweight products include top-notch seat covers, carbon fiber, and plastic hoods, gas tank covers, exhaust shields, shock guards, and much more. Whether you have an ATV, UTV, or snowmobile, Forworks has the goodies that will improve your ride and make you salivate. We trust Forworks for increased function and a sexier look, and you should too. Four Works Carbon, always working hard to bring high quality and innovative parts to the market. Check them out today at fwcarbon.com. All right, back here with Casey Greek on the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. Great to hear from Jeremy there. So grateful to have a promoter and an enthusiast like him as part of our series. But Casey, um, you already kind of kicked off our Impact Solutions Impact Moment segment where we highlight something good and positive happening in ATV motocross. And I was going to ask you what you had. You talked about Briarcliff and everything that Jeremy does for, for the series, puts on an awesome event, all those things, going the extra mile. 
I, what I want to touch on for my impact moment, a uh, little uh, more somber than yours, but the Marshall family is a family from right here in Wisconsin, kind of near me, not that far from where Brooks family is kind of from. And uh, they're competing in the nationals this year. And in the days kind of following the Sunset Ridge National, the, the wife and mother of the family, Brianna Marshall, passed away unexpectedly uh, following that national event in between nationals there. Uh, the good and positive part of this is, is riders like WMX champ Andrea Berger gave her well wishes for the family on the podium, and and they did. The family did go to Briarcliff. I was happy to see that. I think gives some normalcy to the family, and I just think that this is another testament to how amazing the race family is, Casey. So on behalf of Digging Deep, we want to wish uh, our deepest sympathies to Aaron Marshall and the Marshall family during this difficult time. But we've touched on this so many times, and this is something that this segment has really turned into you know, this is just such a big racing family, big ATV motocross is just a big family. And, you know, we kind of band together. And I think that this was just another perfect representation of that. Definitely heavy hearts for them. And, you know, it's always, it's always rough, you know, to have a passing or anyone that's part of our family here and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, it's always cool to see how well the, this family that we call ATV motocross comes together. So it's very impactful. You know, as you know, we've talked about, you know, Abby and, you know, the stuff that she's going through and just so many different people that, you know, we see in this sport that we do. So that's unfortunate for sure. Yeah, we're thinking about them. We'll continue to think about them. But uh, you touched on Abby there. I just received yesterday something special for Abby. So it's going to go out this week. I know that they're avid listeners to the show uh, here. So we got something special on the way this week for Abby. I'm so proud, so happy with the progress. We saw that video, Casey, you sent it to me last week and so did her father. Uh, but she's, man, she's slaying it, right? From what we're seeing, man, she's tough as nails. She's a lot tougher than, than you or I. Yeah, she is incredible. And I mean, for her to be doing what she's doing already, I mean, I, I feel like she's going to end up 100%. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, what a stud and just cool, you know, I mean, not cool that she got hurt, but cool to see someone that's willing to work and, and drive herself that hard. And I mean, I think, you know, I talk to her dad often and I think she's blowing his mind. Mm -hmm. I think so. so it's pretty too. cool to see. I think so too. You know what? Everything happens for a reason. I'm a true believer in that. And this is just going to be an opportunity for her to prove everything that she's capable of to herself. And for it's a good representation for people to kind of see um, anything, anything is possible. Anything that you set your mind to dedication, hard work, anything is possible. So um, no great way to segue from that though. I, I did uh, see Aaron Marshall mention how beautiful uh, the sunsets have been recently and he credited his wife for that kind of tying things up with the Marshall family there. And maybe she was looking down over the weekend at Briarcliff as well, Casey, uh, because on Saturday, at least, man, it looked picture perfect. The track looked amazing. Looked like a beautiful day, big crowd. Um, everything just looked perfect at Briarcliff. Like I said, especially on Saturday. Yeah. What a, what an awesome day. I mean, yeah, we got the unfortunate rain that's been haunting us all season long. Um, but the track crew did an awesome job with that. They had the track rolled in really tight. And, you know, it ended up coming around and we had a pretty good racetrack for Sunday. But, yeah, beautiful day. Um, the crowd, spectator crowd, I thought was great. I know the entries, I seen Jeremy posted something last night. Um, one of the largest events we've had in quite some time. Okay. And I think it goes to show, you know, by promoting the races and, and advertising in the right places and, putting that little extra effort in is why he got, you know, the entries and the spectators that he did. Well, and the extra stuff he does, right. The, the pit bike race and um, just all the special events he does for the families and stuff like that. I think that that impacts that as well. You kind of want to make it an experience. And he told us last year, he told us on the show that, that that's important to him. It's not just a race. It's a, it's an event. It's a spectacle. So um, that truly shows there. So uh, getting into the racing then Casey, you know, the track was fastest in that first time session in the morning there, the first time qualifier was fastest. So the second session, we basically saw no changes to the order An order, which saw Hetrick take the top spot over Hogue, Bryce Ford, Nick Janusa and Weenan. Did you have any major takeaways from uh, the morning qualifying there, Casey? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, really for me, it was Chad in fifth. 
um, unusual care, you know, that's not normal for him. He's usually obviously one or two in qualifying. Um, you know, Brandon was riding really good. Bryce Ford was riding good. And then, you know, Nick starting to show like his qualifying speeds coming back and he's getting himself in those positions early in qualifying. And, and I, I think that's pretty, you know, pretty standout ish of, you know, those guys. And it was just like, just kind of odd with Chad. I mean, to be yep. fit, I'm, I know the track's not necessarily say his style, but he can usually squeak out a second at least when it's not his style. So um, I think it set us up for an awesome day of racing with a lot of unknowns where normally we're just so set on, okay, we know what's going to go on. And um, obviously we've seen that, you know, going to the first moto. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Obviously when you see Chad and fifth, that's very uncharacteristic. Like you said, that's not something that we normally see. I typically, I think that we would see him come out in that second session and really make a push. Right. But uh, I think maybe the track wasn't conducive to that or whatever. And then, like you said, there's a couple of the other two things that stood out to me was Hoag. Brandon has, has become a guy that's put himself at, at the top uh, week in and week out, at least in recent weeks. So that's been impressive. This is a trend at this point, not just a, not just a blip on the radar. And then, yeah, like you said, Nick Janusa is filling out, figuring out this qualifying thing. He really is. So uh, that's impressive to see for him. He's really rounding a corner. Um, okay. So, so then moving on to the races then Casey. So we know how incredibly dominant Joel Hattrick is on these hard packed racetracks. So I think that everyone knew how the opening moto was probably going to go once Joel Hattrick ripped the whole shot in moto one on Saturday. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it, he was rolling and <laughs> It, even like his qualifying time I mean, I seen him ride there before and I did lap times on him. And so I kind of knew where we were going to be lap time wise. And from the last time I did lap times on him to, you know, this weekend, I mean, he dropped almost three seconds and it just being down in the mechanics area, you know, during and just watching how fast those guys are coming by us and the yeah. aggression that yeah. they're putting into, you know, like just this huge wall jump. It, it's insane. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, we kind of knew what to expect from Joel in that sense, but I, the sheer speed that he was willing to go was unreal. And after the race, he's like, yeah, he's like, I, I could see where Chad was. So I wouldn't even have, I didn't really have to push it that hard. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like it's insane. I think you can pick up on that from listening to him after the races that he's just on another level right now. I think he's more locked in than we've ever seen. So that's uh, awesome to see. And then, like you said, I mean, to testimony to the class, how we say it on every show, at least I do, but that freaking class is so gnarly right now. There are no guys out there to make that front pack or even, you know, the top 10, 12 guys. So basically everybody, uh, there's nobody out there to make them look as gnarly as they are. There's no normal guys out there. They're all freaks. Uh, that just the level is so high and kind of, you know, touching on that. I mean, Brandon Hogue really did keep Joel honest for some time in this moto. He was within two seconds, 10 minutes into the race, Casey, like Brandon was impressive. I know I always think of Brandon as a good hard packed rider. Uh, sometimes I think he fights me on that, but man, like, he, he had another really impressive first moto uh, all but, you know, the last lap there. But, man, he rode a masterful race. I thought, like, uh, he was one of the guys that stole the show, especially in that first moto there. Brandon Hogue clearly running second that whole race. Late in the race, he was five seconds up on the battle for third, and he was, you know, only five seconds behind Joel. So, uh, you know, I was came away just impressed again by Brandon Hogue. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there there was a couple of times in the opening laps that he was like really knocking on the door with Joel and, you know, Joel was like, damn, like, you know, he had to kind of mm -hmm. step it to the next level to try to get a little breather on him. And, you know, I, I talked to Joel, we had um, breakfast Sunday morning, kind of just sitting there by the little cafe at Briarcliff and just talking, kind of recapping the day, and he's like, "Man, he was he was rolling." And there's no doubt. I mean, Brandon rides the hard pack tracks really well. Yeah. Brandon rides everything really well, yep. and he 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 was clear cut. You know, that first moto, second place guy. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. Uh, another couple notables early in this race. So Bryce Ford went down right away. Did you see what happened there, Casey, at the start of the first moto for Bryce Ford? No, it was right in a section where we're, we're in the tower. We couldn't see. Okay. And even talking to Bryce, like he, he really couldn't even tell me like what happened, but he did something hit him in the hand and like yeah. his hand after the day was like super swollen. And 
So it was weaker. And I think, you know, a lot of that kind of played into what that first moto was for him. Of course. Yeah. And then, you know, just a couple little things through qualifying, you know, not really getting to ride much in the second qualifier because of the way the track was mm-hmm. that, you know, we kind of made a couple I don't want to say bad decisions, but just decisions off of what we felt in the first qualifier that when the track came around, weren't quite the best for the second, mo- our first moto. Um, we corrected that for the second moto, obviously, and seeing a whole different uh, rider out there. But yeah, just a struggle with the with the hand after he come off the bike. Um, but yeah, we couldn't see what ended up going on back there. Okay. Yeah. I wondered that obviously we knew something happened on the first lap or right away, uh, you know, kind of off the start there. And then, then yeah, he spots the field, you know, a a nice gap there. So he comes out last and then it was the exact opposite for Zach Decker. Uh, He started nearly uh, at the front of this thing and ran in the top five for a good portion of this race. So it was a good showing in that first moto for the rookie early in this one, Casey. Yeah, Zach was on it. um, Riding really, really well. And look like one of the season season veterans out there. I mean, it's just, you know, put himself in a good position. You know, he lost a couple of positions to like really good guys, but mm-hmm. he was battling for those positions and fighting tooth and nail. I mean, him and I think him and Australia and him and Nick, they went back and forth, you know, with each other and made for a great race. So um stoked to see the rookie, you know, put himself in the position that he expects to be in. And I yep. we all know. Zach is fast and it's just, you know, minimizing some of the little mistakes and little things, you know, in his rookie year. And he's going to be a key player in this, you know, top, you know, guys, you know, week in, week out. Yeah, he's going to fit in there for sure. And when you just look at the results sheet and see sixth next to his name, I mean, that pops. Like, that's impressive in, the, in this class right now. So, uh, now to the fun stuff, Casey. So, uh, Max Linquist stole the show for me, um, or at least in this moto he did. He ran in the top three throughout, but around halfway is when you start to notice he's really racing Chad Weenan and countering his every move, keeping him at bay. What were you seeing there from Max Linquist, man? I just lap after lap after lap he was able to ward off Chad and it just impressed me uh beyond words really I I was at a loss of words for for seeing what Max Linquist did on Saturday in that first moto so impressed by him yeah for sure it was a great race um he gave Chad everything Chad could handle Mm -hmm. and you know Chad ended up not making the pass on him and I hats off to Max I mean he held his ground against, you know, someone that a lot of times intimidates people almost out of their way because of, you know, his sheer size and strength. And every time Chad would make a, you know, a move, you know, there, there wasn't a huge number of places where you could just straight up pass someone, you know, railed outside or sneak under the inside. And Max was taking obviously the correct lines. And so there, you know, Chad would have to come in and bump on him. And I think that was all good. Um, He wouldn't just, straight up you know try to t-bone them or get desperate by any means and some of these corners where they were kind of bumping are, are really fast and so I think you know obviously Chad smart enough that he knows you know I'm not going to just go in there and smash him in that because we're both going to end up down and instead right. of it being a fourth place this moto it's going to be a sixth or seventh place to this moto or something like that and lose even more points so Chad you know tried to make the move and Max could counter it and you know that kind of shows you what we got with these guys is Max ain't going to roll over for Chad. Bryce isn't going to roll over for Chad. Rastrelli's not going to roll over. They're, they're all mentally very strong in what they want to do and push, you know, to get these guys in there. So um, very proud of Max. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I posted during the moto on our play by play on Facebook, how headstrong is Max Linquist? Because it's truly remarkable to think about all the pressure he was under to think about the bumping from Chad. And obviously, like you said, nothing egregious. This is truly racing. But when you have Chad Weenan bumping you like, you know, like, let's go. Um, and, and then you're Max and you're kind of his understudy. I just kept thinking to myself, like, man, like that's his mentor. Like, I wonder what he's thinking in this moment. And he never cracked Casey. Like that was just so impressive to me. And we got Max coming up on the show. I'm going to ask him, but man, like we've never really seen that. Like, when have we seen that from Chad where one of these kids 
was able to do what Max did on Saturday. That's why it was so impressive to me. So for 12 long and grueling laps, Max Lindquist was able to hold off Chad Wienan. Let's get Max in here to chat about it right here on the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. All right, guys, this young star might have shined brighter than anyone at Briarcliff, brought to you by DID Racing Chain and their 520 ATV2 X-Ring Chain. Pick up an ATV2 chain today at your local dealer or whatever DID chains are sold. Welcome back your third place podium finisher in Ohio, second year pro, Mr. Max Linquist. What's up, buddy? Welcome back to the show. Hey, Cody. Uh, good to hear from you. Good to be back. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, ha- sitting here after a pretty solid weekend, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. We were just chatting about, uh, you're kind of riding that high yet. So, uh, Max, you looked like a completely different rider this, this past weekend, uh, starts were dialed, everything was clicking, but take me through what it was like to have Chad Weenan, your mentor breathing down your neck for 20 consecutive minutes this past Saturday. What was that like? Uh, shoot. What was it like? Nothing I ever experienced before. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it, it was definitely a, a first, and so, but it was definitely one to never forget. So, just uh, actually, at first, kind of felt like a uh, another practice day. So, to be totally honest, just uh, with how things laid out, like it was kind of just the two of us. Like there was a little gap between me and Hogue, and then you know, with him right behind me, like I was pretty comfy at the pace I was at, and I didn't quite feel like I could push the pace like the front two guys were at at the po- at that point in time yet, and um, you know, I just kind of knew I had to ride my own race and do what I could. And luckily, uh, it was good enough to, you know, keep them behind me, which, uh, doesn't usually happen in practice. So it made it a little more fun. <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what my mind went to there, and, and I think I did post, I posted like how headstrong is Max Linquist here is you, know, you got Chad all over, you know, right there. And, and I got to believe he's bumping you and stuff like that. Right. Like you obviously feel him there. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, man, does Max feel any pressure? I mean, it's Chad, like for you, I mean, it being Chad is a little different than it being anybody else. Uh, in my mind, I was just trying to figure out like, man, like what is Max thinking right now? But, but maybe you were just able to focus on, on the racing and that was it. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it was probably like, for me, I don't know if I've ever maybe had that amount of focus before like I don't know what I did or what happened it just everything seemed to click like just had a good start and from there everything just kind of like the momentum was just rolling and um you know I knew like I practiced with Chad all the time and I think for me like that was a a super big help just kind of having an idea like you know how where he likes to make his moves and Mm kind of used to like having him knocking on the door so I mean, to be totally honest, I, I guess I didn't necessarily expect to stay in front of him for all 20 minutes. Like, I all sure. of a sudden started surprised at myself. Like, okay, like, mm-hmm. obviously the pace is pretty good. And from there, I just knew, like, you know, we practiced, you know, day in and day out. And, like, always know just keep my head forward and keep pushing. And I just, you know, that's all I kept doing was just kept thinking about my marks and what I was doing. And it just seemed to pay off. So I was – I honestly uh, definitely surprised myself with that, with that ride right there. That's awesome. And somebody asked me what I thought of what you did in that first moto on Saturday. And my response was, I think that that's what makes the best of the best, the best, you know, like, like you were able to kind of just go into hyper focus mode and, and not think too much about what was going on or who it was, or kind of the magnitude of the moment when I think lesser people, I mean, me, I would have been totally in my head. So uh, like I said, I, I feel like the best of the best are cut from a different cloth. And I think that that's kind of what we saw from you. I don't know how else to explain it, but that was kind of my gut reaction as I was seeing this go down. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. The That's awesome to hear. And I mean, for me, that's just kind of how it worked out. Like, I guess I never, like, I knew it was Chad and um, I, I kind of knew like just to, you know, watch my insides and, but at the same time, like, I didn't really want to ride too protective. And I just kind of knew like, um, you know, if I was, if I was fast enough and I hit my marks, like I knew it was a hard track to pass on. And like, I knew I was rolling pretty good and I just, you know, made sure to keep my head forward and stay calm. And, um, you know, it all just started to work out. And as the time went, like I started getting tired and tired and I'm like, (laughs) Oh man, like I knew he was pushing for a mistake. And, um, you know, I had a couple little bobbles, but nothing real bad. And, um, you know, as the moto went, the, the pressure started to build and, you know, 
started to throw in a tire every now and then. And I'm like, oh, boy. And when that two-lap card came out, I was like, yeah, this is this is going to be interesting. Because I, I knew um, just from practicing with each other, like, I would say between the two of us with how competitive are, like, it's even more of a challenge. Like, neither one of us was going to let the other – was going to back down to the other. So, right. um, I, I knew I was like, man, like, I might be holding them up a bit. But at the same time, like – you know, we've made it this far, ain't letting off now. Like we're yeah. going to keep going for it. And, um, you know, that to me, that's probably when it started to set in the most, like, um, you know, that he was there and I really had to watch what I was doing was when that two lap card came out, like really just had to put my head down and focus forward. Um, cause I knew like if anything was going to happen, it always seems to be like when we practice at that 18, 20 minute mark, and he seems to make something miraculous happen. I'm like, all right, I just got to hit my marks and do what I can and, you know, hope everything falls into place. And, you know, felt bad for Hogue with the breakdown on the last lap, really didn't plan on that, um, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time was – couldn't believe it at the same time when that was happened to pull off a second-place finish was definitely an awesome feeling. For sure. I mean, so for me, Max, as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking like it's a little bit surreal, you know, like obviously we saw you just put together a, a magnificent moto. It was it was near perfect for what you had to deal with there. But when's the last time that we saw, you know, a, a younger, a younger guy in the pro class do that to chat? So in my mind, I'm like, like, man, I don't know that it's been a long time since we saw something like that. So given those circumstances, I mean, we saw stuff like Daytona and whatever, but that was just little bit different circumstances there so uh that's what kind of stood out to me that's what was surreal for me um okay so so you you never give up the control of that position then right so you you inherit second there on the last lap you mentioned brandon oak you finish second chad finishes third you cross the finish line uh having you know finished second between joel hattrick and chad weenan so what were your emotions then when you do cross the finish line and you take that spot and then take me through what chad's reaction action was after that hard fought battle with you like like what did chad say to you max oh man um uh, i was pumped you know um that was uh i couldn't believe it i couldn't believe i just did that kind of moment and um uh, yeah. you know I, I got a high five we rolled back to the trailer and um you know i was on a i was sky high you know i was sitting it was awesome and for him i think it was kind of he was i think it was you know a hard one to swallow but uh, props to him, you know, came over and, uh, gave me a hug and, you know, said congrats. And, you know, I think he made it pretty clear. It wasn't, he, he didn't plan on that happen again, but, uh, you know, he, he, he was pretty cool about it. So props to him for coming over and, you know, uh, definitely made my day. Um, was also fun to kind of lay it in there that it was the first time I really ever straight up beat him. So, cause even in practice, he always likes to pull off the pass at the end. So, that was a pretty cool moment for me at the same time, but yeah, just, uh, definitely, uh, another, you know, like I kind of said on the podium, like it was just another check mark, like definitely something that I've been striving for, for a while and been working for. And it was, uh, you know, another one of those things that I can say I've done and now we just need to figure out how to keep doing it. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that there's so many qualities about that guy, right. That, uh, younger racers like yourself and so many others, you know, should or, or could emulate because it, he kind of shows, he's kind of showing like how a person should act in defeat, right? Like, obviously he didn't want to lose to you, Max. Um, you might've been the number one guy that if he had to lose to somebody, you might've been the guy that he would have chose as the number one draft pick there. Um, but yeah, like he's just such a true champion through and through. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's how it was handled. Then I had no doubts that that's how it was going to be, but yeah, I got to believe that you were sky high there. So I mentioned that your starts were dialed in. You grabbed the whole shot in moto two, you and Joel were neck and neck there. Joel gets by and then what happens when, when Chad makes the pass, take my listeners through that, because I didn't, I didn't see that there at the beginning of moto two. So tell me about that. Yeah. Um, you know, awesome start, just, uh, focus was awesome and executed that well. And Joel was nuts and just launched a roller farther than I ever would have, but it was good to see at the time. So, um, but from there just kind of fell in line and, um, you know, I obviously knew Chad was there again. And at that point in time, I'm like, all right, like we did it once. Like, I guess let's see what happens this time. So I, I, I had a pretty good feeling. Like we came around 
midway through the lap when we hit, got through the back section and we had to hit a wall jump. Chad, Chad uh, he's not one to usually bomb things or, you know, make harsh moves. And he launched that thing up next to me and I was like, okay, he, he's serious this time. Like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, I was like, if he, if he was trying hard last time, he's tried harder this time. Cause I, I don't think I was pretty sure he wasn't wanting to lose to me twice in a row and not, not, but maybe three turns later, he kind of, he, uh, you know, he stuck it to me. So it was, it was a racing move. So it was, uh, you know, came into that inside roller and he had kind of like the motor moto previous, like tried the line he used. And I think he like pulled up a little bit cause it was, it was pretty dicey. Like, it was going to be, there was going to be a little contact and it was going to be like maybe a little bit out of our comfort zone, but you know, for him, I think he was, he was seeing a championship in points and just went for it. And mm -hmm. not that I can't blame him. He did it. So, you know, he, he got, he got in the inside of me and just kind of took the line away. And unfortunately, like when I got up on top of the berm, just hooked, hooked the top of the berm and went over the bars real quick. Like, literally still have my hand on the clutch, but just happened to go over the bars and get stuck on top of the berm. So wasn't exactly how I was planning that going. Um, but you know, uh, was able to at least get up and going and didn't get hurt or nothing. So can't complain there and just, you know, did what I needed to, to get on that podium, but definitely, uh, was a little, a little different than what I was hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Obviously um, when you get it, you get the whole shot, actually, you start off front like that. You think things are going to go a little bit differently, but yeah, you come from the back, then you're forced to come from the back. You claw your way all the way up to seventh, which like, you know, is good enough, obviously for the podium spot, but I got to believe given the circumstances, you having to bust your tail in that second moto to get up there and earn that podium spot. And it was, it was close, you know, with some guys there uh, late in that race with the way the points were breaking, breaking down. So I feel like that probably made the podium celebration that much more special because it wasn't like cruising top three all day, like fell right into place. You had to earn that thing in the second moto. Yeah, no, um, I, I was like, man, for ripping a start, that was probably one of the hardest <laughs> ride for like starting out front. I somehow still had to pass everyone, so I was like, that really <laughs> didn't work out as I was planning. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, like I didn't really know. Like initially, when it happened, I was so far behind, I kind of almost felt like it was out of reach. Um, but I just put my head down and you know kept riding and um, all sudden I started getting the pit board like I just needed you know another pass like just one at a time and all of a sudden I got to a point where I got into seventh and like that you know top six kind of separated themselves from from where I was at and like I had my head down for like a lap or two and was pushing to try and see if I could bridge the gap and like it really wasn't happening like they were pretty much matching we were all matching speed and um believe it or not i i didn't realize it at first but all of a sudden i start you know seeing pit boards like slow down and i'm thinking like why do i gotta slow down like i'm in seventh like there's no way i wasn't thinking i could get a seventh place finish and right. end up on the podium but all of a sudden i'm like slow down like you've got third and i'm like thinking to myself no way and started doing the math as we're you know getting to these final laps and mm -hmm. like i didn't really know who was in third or fourth or, or whatever and I was just kind of had to trust them and kind of pulled back and just rode, you know, rode the rest of the race out. And even like when I pulled up to the podium, I wasn't exactly sure if I was on it or not. So for it to all work out how it did was definitely kind of like a big bonus on the day. So, cause I was, I was pretty sure after having to get off, there's not many people that can say like, Oh yeah, I, you know, crashed in the second moto and ended up third overall. Still like that podium. was, uh, yeah, yeah, that was definitely the exclamation point on the day. Is, yeah. So. Yeah, Max, you know, I predicted it just one week early. You were on my fantasy team at sunset and, you know, it just didn't work out for me there. Um, yeah. but, but man, yeah, I was stoked to see that this weekend. Incredible ride. Like, like you said, I mean, how many people can crash in one of those motos and still put it on the box? That, that's amazing. So, um, so now, Max, you're in position in points here where you really have nothing to lose. You can pretty much go for it every weekend and just try to rack up as many podiums here late in the season as possible. You really don't have anything to risk at this point as far as like points wise go by pushing it. And that makes you dangerous, at least from my perspective. Yeah, I mean, definitely isn't where I'd like to be sitting, but, um, you know, just how the things that went, like, it was really good to get this, you know, get on the podium here, like that really, um, 
you know, fuels me up and makes this three weeks go by probably a lot faster and makes things going to make things seem a lot easier. So, um, you know, hopefully I, I seem to always kind of find my stride later in the year. It's kind of always been that way since I've had a little kid and I really, I really favor these next couple tracks, um, coming up. So obviously, yeah, don't have much to lose, but yet looking to gain anything I can. So hopefully can keep up the momentum. And I feel like I've learned a few things and taken a few things from these weekends now, and I'm hoping to kind of continue on the path we're on. So it, it's been a good, this was a good like start to hopefully what we can continue to do for the year. Yeah. And, and by what I meant by that was, you know, there's people that get in a position where they're trying to, you know, sit on the egg that they have, right. Play, play protector with, you know, maybe the points advantage they have. And that's what I mean by it. you're in a position where you can, you can kind of risk it all. Like look at last year, you string together these two podiums and man, like it could have been three, who knows what happens at Briarcliff last year at the end there. But you were making up so many points. I mean, maybe this is just the start of you doing that again. I mean, nothing's impossible. I'm not counting you out, pal. I don't think anybody should. Well, I appreciate it. And definitely, definitely not count myself out yet. Hoping to, you know, kind of like you said, just keep plugging away one moto at a time and just seeing where we're at. Like, that's kind of the goal from here on out is just, you know, I've obviously showed myself and proved that I can kind of be up on that podium, at, you know, every moto in and out just those starts have been key for me, like figuring that out has made things a thousand times easier. So hopefully can really keep those things going and just, you know, keep riding this wave of momentum. I kind of got, yeah, I'd love to see it, pal. And I think that that's one of those things. It doesn't matter what level of racing you're at, but when you get on the podium for the first time or, um, you know, you've done four times now, but the more you do it, the more it's expected. I'm sure, you know, going forward, anytime anybody's on that podium and it's not you, you're going to feel like, man, damn, that's my spot. So I'm sure that that makes you, you know, that much more hungry going forward. Yeah, definitely, you know, fuels the fire and just, you know, also at the same time, like it was a, it was a, a well-needed break I felt like it was something that you know had been putting in the work for a while and just had some weird things going on and it was uh definitely you know a weight off the shoulders especially at this race like it was this was not a race I wanted to necessarily come back to I'd say like just uh with how things that went in the year past like coming into this race like I really came in just like oh man if I could get out of here with you know, a top five or just leaving healthy, like would be a good step in the right direction after how things went last year. And it was a definitely a total 180 turn of events for me. So, you know, with all that happening, it was definitely very rewarding and definitely going to take that one and, yeah, you know, keep the highs and hopefully uh, continue rolling with it. Yeah. Yeah. The performance this year was a light year away from that broken collarbone last year that you experienced at Briarcliff. So yeah, night and day difference, pal. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. I love to hear it. And uh, pal, I, I got to obviously wish you congratulations on, on an incredible job this weekend. It was awesome to see. So you have an extra week off here in between races. Uh, what do you have planned for that? I know you have a riding school. We touched on that before we hit record on this thing. Uh, do you have any other special plans, anything special going on with that extra week in between races? here yeah i mean uh you know riding schools doing the same old same old working out and actually hoping to uh, got some plans here to head down and see mr chris hunt and hopefully uh check in on mr mike allred and see how him and his family are doing after his little get off there so hoping to go see him and uh kind of see how he's doing and you know maybe uh give him something to do for a little bit so i'm uh, hoping to go see them guys and check in with them and hopefully have a good time while we're at it Nice. I like to hear it. Grind time. I dig it. Max, congrats on your uh, your fourth career pro class podium. Uh, we won't soon forget what a ride you had on Saturday. Enjoy it, pal. Was proud of you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Cody. Briarcliff podium finisher Max Linquist right here on the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast brought to you by DID Racing Chain, the 520 ATV2 X-Ray Chain. Thanks, pal. As the number one podcast in ATV racing, it's only right that we partner with the industry leaders in suspension tuning. Insert Impact Solutions. Impact Solutions is a full-service ATV and side-by-side suspension center specializing in the revalving and service of your motocross and off-road suspension. With over 25 years of elite-level knowledge, experience, and testing with riders of all ages and ability levels, Casey Greek, Jay Goebel, and the Impact crew strive to exceed the client's expectations for service and setup. Impact Solutions is the official Elka Suspension Service Center of the United States, offering unmatched product knowledge and experience. Whether you're in need of service, 
parts, warranty, sales, or technical support, Impact Solutions has you covered. Head over to ImpactSolutionsATV.com or give them a call today. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. The following message is brought to you by Manscaped.com. The Manscaped engineering team has outdone themselves this time, creating the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, now available for purchase in the U.S. and Canada. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped, an official sponsor of the Digging Deep ATV MX podcast, with this exclusive offer of 20% off and free worldwide shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. I'm one of the first people to try the new 4.0 and I am blown away. This thing is next level. What sets this trimmer apart from all the rest? The Lawnmower 4.0 gives you the ability to turn the LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. It features a new multi-functioning on-off switch with travel lock for those of us who like to travel. And my favorite, the new trimmer allows you to customize your trim with four different guard lengths and upgrade from its predecessor that only featured two. If you're listening, you know that good tools are a must, so wait no more to get the best tools for the job. Get 20% off and free shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com by using code DIGGINGDEEP20. Hey everyone, this is Larry Mills, president of DP Breaks North America and proud partner of the Digging Deep ATV MX podcast. We at DP Breaks are a longtime supporter of ATV racing and the world leader in centered brake technology, dominating the ATV world for decades by supporting the best four wheel racers on the planet. This year's lineup includes Jeff Restrelli, Mark Baldwin and Baldwin Motorsports, Ford Brothers Racing, Nick Janusa, and many more, including Mr. Digging Deep himself, Cody Jansen, plus all the top 17 GNCC pros such as seven time champion Walker Fowler, Bryce O'Neill, Hunter Hart. Cole Richardson, Jared McClure, Adam McGill, and previous champion Chris Borch. These top riders continue to appreciate the high performance and impressive durability that their DP brakes have to offer. Products that ultimately help place them on top of the podium week after week. DP brakes are available through www.dp-brakes.com or you can purchase them through your local parts and limited stocking dealer, or you can even message us, myself, Larry Mills, or DP Brakes on Instagram or Facebook. And if you have any questions about product or sponsorship support, please ask us. We are waiting for you. Join the best ATV riders in the world equipped with DP Brakes, and have a great year, everyone. Nearing two decades into the brand's existence, Factory 43 is back and better than ever, continuing to make major waves in the ATV world. For the third consecutive season, Factory 43 is the official aluminum parts choice of the Phoenix Racing ATV team, providing their state-of-the-art Evo Nerf bars, MX-style front bumpers, and grab bars for two-time champ Joel Hetrick. If you're in the market to upgrade your Nerf bars, bumpers, or grab bars, head over to factory43atv.com to see their full line of industry-leading products available for all makes and models. Head over to factory43atv.com today. Success in the ATV MX world is similar to what creates financial success as well. The right people, the right advice, and more importantly, hard work and the benefit of an ongoing relationship as situations change and adversity is experienced. Do you have the right financial advisor to help you reach your goals? Haymower Financial Group can create a personalized, goal-based plan to help your family prepare for whatever life brings. Call me, Scott Haymower, at Haymower Financial Group, a private wealth advisory practice of Ameriprise Financial Services, at 920-338-8150. That's 920-338-8150. Offices located in beautiful De Pere, Wisconsin, with registrations and clients nationwide. All right, back here with Casey Greek on the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. You just heard from Max Linquist there. Uh, Casey, one thing that I was super curious to ask you about was what the interaction was like or what you saw between Chad Wienan and Max Linquist following the conclusion of that opening motor. Did you catch any of that at all? Um, I didn't really see it, but I, I did ask Max, like, you know, I was, <laughs> I was Chad, you know, because they were parked pretty close together and obviously they're pretty good friends and, and, Max said, you know, Chad was a professional, he, you know, he, he thought I rode good and, you know, did the right things. I'm sure on the inside, Chad wasn't very happy to lose those extra couple points, you know, Brandon Hogue, you know, having his issue on the last lap really saved, you know, another couple points for Chad mm-hmm. in that setup, you know, where Chad would end up fourth. And I think that would have been one of the first times I've seen Chad. Well, I guess we've seen Daytona, but, Chad finished off the podium in a straight up race where, you know, there wasn't a huge incident. 
-hmm. just, just, uh, I think that it shows the true championship nature of Chad Wienan. You know, like you said, uh, he's the ultimate competitor, obviously, you know, he wasn't satisfied with the way it went, but was able to, you know, congratulate Max. I uh, was happy to hear Max touch on that as well. So that was cool. Uh, so no drama there, but we did have some drama elsewhere on that final lap. Of course, I'm talking about Brandon Hogue, who had rode an absolutely masterful race. He was just five seconds, like I said earlier, back of Joel Hetrick and five seconds ahead of the battle for third. So clearly in second, like you said earlier, Casey, the clear cut uh, second place guy in this moto, no doubt when his motor blew on the final lap, what a freaking heartbreaker, Casey Daytona. He breaks while leading Iron Man. He breaks a ball joint with the, the finish line in sight while in position to win his first overall of his career. And now this, uh, you know, a few more of those things, a few of those things go differently, Casey, and he's pushing Chad Wienan for second in points. <laughs> yeah. Um, crazy to even think about having that many issues, you know, for in, in one season and in, in six races, you know, to have just, ooh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how he, he processes that stuff. Um, you know, I think it's different for everybody, but it, yeah, he's definitely got to be, you know, somewhat heartbroken, but I know Brandon, I mean, he's so hard on himself. He's probably blaming himself for it. We, you know, we make light of it or, you know, we kind of joke or whatever with how hard Brandon is on himself. But in reality, you know, that's the truth right there is we've seen it for a lot of years and his riding is really good right now. Yeah, it is. And it's just, he's got a, you know, or him or the team or whatever it is. And, you know, it's just like freak things. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, that the music racing team is doing a bad job. It's just yeah. freak little things that are causing this stuff. I mean, they're putting, you know, new parts in. They're they're trying to do everything they can. And I think when you get to that level, you know, the speed and Brandon's speed is definitely picked up from years past. And new things are going to happen. So you kind of have to learn that. And, you know, we've seen grown pains with Joel you know, on Hondas and on Yamahas, like, you know, just not so much like since on the Yamaha wise, it's been pretty consistent, but we're, we're all still learning stuff and developing, you know, at that speed that Joel's going to run and Brandon's, you know, just a barely a tick off of that speed. Mm -hmm. So they're learning and they're going to, they're going to figure it out. And, you know, he's going to, he should be able to string some, you know, good motos together and, you know, we he's proved to us a couple times this year like he's capable of you know possibly winning overall or you know a moto win or something like that so um yeah i i feel bad for those guys but they're hard workers and none of those guys that are involved in that program have gotten to this level by not being hard workers so i'm sure they're going to figure it out. No, I mean, credit to credit to those guys, credit to the, the music racing and repair team. They've been killing it. I mean, this is by far the best Brandon that we've ever seen. No doubt in my mind. So uh, credit to those guys for getting him to that level. And like you said, it hasn't been the same issue like week after week. It's not like they're having the same problem every week. It's, you know, at the first race, it was that coolant spigot that they said was an OEM part. And then at, at Ironman, it was a faulty ball joint. And, you know, now it's an exhaust valve from what I, what I heard. So uh, just, you know, one thing after another, but it's different things. And I think that, you know, you got to just hope that all this bad luck is out of his system. He's got to be thinking, man, not again. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know, just credit to him. If he keeps his nose down, like, you know, we know he will, he keeps grinding. Everything's going to come together for him. If he keeps putting himself in good position, only good things are going to come from that. So uh, with Brandon breaking, Max would inherit second and Chad uh, third. Honorable mention to Jeffrey Rastrelli and Nick Janusa, who rode their ways, uh, rode their tails off to get up to fourth and fifth at the finish in this one. Uh, both of those guys rode well. Both of them kind of rose through the pack uh, credit to those guys for that. Uh, moving on to the second moto then, Casey. Uh, Max Linquist's stellar day continued at the start of Moto2. He rips the whole shot as he crossed the line nearly side by side with Joel Hetrick. Joel would make the pass. And then what happens, Casey? Tell me about that. I think you already referenced it. You might have saw it. Paint the picture for me when Chad Wienan <laughs> made the pass on Max Linquist. What do you see there? <laughs> I didn't get to see it. Like, this is one of the first races this year that I actually waited down for the parade lap to be over and then watched the start 
from the starting line and then ran to the tower. Okay. And by that time it had happened because they were right there in the turn before um, the Bigfoot jump. But from what I heard, it, Chad wasn't there to wait around. Let's put it that way. I mean, it was, I don't think Chad meant for Max to come off the machine by any means. I think it was, you know, I'm going to pass you right here, right now. And, you know, like I referenced earlier, like that track, a lot of the passes that had to be made, you had to almost stop, you know, the guy that you're racing against to be able to make the pass. And that's what happened. And it got Max up on the berm and Max flipped over the front of the handlebars and, you know, luckily he didn't get hurt. He's all good. Got back up and rebounded, you know, but it took him a minute to get going and get back on. But yeah, it was very aggressive, but it wasn't like, again, just a straight center punch to the Nerf bar. Oh, no. You know, it was just, it was get out of my way. I'm going. Exactly. So. That, that's even what Max said. I mean, Max said he could sense the urgency from Chad. Chad meant nothing bad by it. And even Max said, like, I still had my, you know, my hand on the clutch. I just wasn't mounted to the quad anymore. So it wasn't, it wasn't egregious. Not like he hit, hit the ground too hard. That's not what Chad was trying to do. But when you get the whole shot, you think that things are, you know, not going to be as difficult as they ended up being for Max. We'll get into that. But Chad definitely began to send it from that point on. You could tell the intensity he had when he passed Max and uh, he closed the gap on Joel a few laps into this one, but then Joel was able to figure out some lines, figure some stuff out and get that lead up to five or six seconds where it would stay for the rest of this moto, Casey. Yeah, it was crazy. I was like, you know, I'm standing up there and we're watching and I'm like, wow. I'm like, Chad's closing on Joel quick. Mm-hmm. Like, what's going on here? Well, Joel didn't realize that it was Chad. He thought it was Max and he thought he was doing enough to keep the gap. And then all of a sudden Chad was on his rear bumper and he kind of, I don't know, I guess coming in a corner or going out of the corner or whatever, seeing that it was Chad. And he told me, he's like, I then I had to drop the hammer. <laughs> you know, obviously had to get away from him and, you know, sprinted away a little bit, changed some lines and, figured out some things that he could do a little bit better and and got himself that gap but he was definitely just kind of conserving to an extent like you know didn't have to go crazy and then when he seen Chad was pushing the pace it, it, he had to step it up so but you know to see Chad even come around you know from fifth in qualifying which we talked about is very unusual for him but for him to come around so well by that second moto to be able to run the pace with Joel that we didn't see earlier in the day is it was also very impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree hundred percent. Moving on to some of the other guys in the class. So there was some comeback rides going on for two guys trying to salvage the day. Brandon Hogue was back in the top three for most of this race after that heartbreaker at the end of moto one. And after a get off led to finishing seventh in the first moto Bryce Ford battled with Hogue in this one and ultimately took the third spot from him late in the race, Casey, but that was impressive by those two guys to kind of turn the tide on their day there. And Bryce, like you said, you guys kind of tweaked some stuff with, with the bike, right. Got, got the, the bike, right. I know that that bike was tweaked. It seemed like after um, that get off of his in the first moto. So everything got square, uh, everything got tuned the way he wanted it. And he went out there and had some fun in that second moto and put it in the third spot. That was impressive by, by Bryce and, and, and Brandon too, to kind of uh, salvage the day there. And he really did salvage points with that fourth then that he finished uh, impressive rides for both of those guys yeah that that was probably one of the better rides i've seen out of bryce this year i mean obviously texas you know daytona he had a great ride going until you know like the last lap i mean he still had a great day fourth is never a bad day by any means mm-hmm. but it, it was you know potentially a second until a little little issue there on, at the end of daytona but um this was one of the best heartfelt rides I think I've seen from Bryce I mean he he come out almost dead last and somehow between the first corner being dead last and the chicane section and the corner where he ended up coming off the bike the first moto and then coming through the rollers on the far side of the track he went from pretty much dead last I mean that's called second to dead you know to about fifth Oh, and I, I would love to see GoPro footage of what he did or how he pulled that off because all those guys were so tight. I know Zach Decker went flipping in like the second corner and might have pushed a couple of guys wider and let Bryce sneak under the inside of that second corner. But once they turned that corner, we really couldn't see them. So we couldn't see what they were doing. And it was like by the time they come back into where we could see the, the race, he was up there. And I think that was awesome. Uh, 
and then he just pushed. And he once he got himself into fourth, he kind of locked himself in on Brandon and just went into stalker mode and just inch and inch and inch. It wasn't like it was, you know, like Brandon wasn't riding to the full potential. He was riding the first moto. He was riding just as good. He was. They were both flying, and it was just – couple tents in this corner, a couple tents in this one, just, you know, just little by little got up there to him and made one of the cleanest passes that I've seen all weekend around, you know, pulled him on the inside. And once he got around him, I think he, he knew, okay, like I I'm comfortable. My bike's good. You know, we're putting the pain of the hand out of the way and, and did it. And, you know, the same thing for Brandon, I think so much mental has to go into these guys and, to you know have a 12th the first moto after being solid second you know mentally i think you got to be sort of drained by toward you know middle of the half of that second moto when you have all that stuff that you're thinking about from the first moto and you know it, but still rebounded great Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think that 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 grouping man is so competitive right now. Uh, and it kind of showed on on Saturday with those guys. And um, yeah, it's just uh, awesome to see awesome to see for Bryce too. like, I'm glad that he was kind of able to write the ship, you know, kind of get back to the Bryce that we were seeing earlier in the year. These last couple motos have been, you know, a little difficult for him just dealing with some adversity, some get offs and stuff like that. So I'm just glad to see him get uh, get back to the Bryce that we know and love. So uh, behind those guys, it was Janusa, Rastrelli, and Linquist made his way up to seventh, which we know was good enough for an overall podium when combined with his runner-up finish in that opening moto. So uh, Hetrick goes 1-1, Wienan goes 3-2 for second, Max goes 2-7 for third. Then behind that podium trio, Bryce Ford ends up fourth overall, just one point back with 7-3 moto finishes. Rastrelli goes four, six for fifth. And I honestly, I thought that Jeffrey had a pretty good day. I'll let you touch on him. We haven't touched on him yet, Casey, but I thought Jeffrey rode pretty well. Like again, topsy turvy kind of day for all those guys kind of in the podium mix, but Jeffrey was impressive. This is another impressive race for Jeffrey. Yeah. I, I thought Jeffrey rode pretty well. Um, made a couple changes with him and, and kind of like his call, let him, you know, kind of go a direction and we end up going back the other direction for the second moto. And it, it really, I think it's come down to like starts more or less for, I think every one of these guys sometimes, you know, where they, you can see how flippy floppy it is. Max two, seven, Bryce seven, three, <laughs> yeah. you know, Jeffrey four, six, like any one of these guys can be seventh one moto and be second or third, the next moto. And, you know, Mr. Consistency over here, Nick, you know, he's right there, but yeah, Jeffrey rode good. He doesn't think he did. Um, he wasn't very happy after the second moto with, you know, he just wanted, wanted better. He wants more. He's really, you know, fired up to try to secure that third position in points too. You know, that's a, it's a huge battle between these guys with Brandon and Bryce and Jeffrey right now. They're, they're all tight in points. So, yeah. Um, he got an opportunity there, you know, with Brandon breaking Moto One that it helped, you know, really get Jeffrey some good points towards getting closer or solidified, say, more in that uh, fourth position, you know, and try to make up some points he, with him beating Bryce the first Moto, you know, really helped him. But then to not beat those guys in the second Moto kind of almost evened it out. But, it you did. know, the points are tight with those guys. So it did. not a not a bad day at all for Jeffrey. Um, I mean, I know he'll disagree with me, but <laughs> hey, I say, I say every weekend, I say on every one of these shows <laughs> that if you're in the top five, there is nothing wrong with that. Like, obviously we know Jeffrey wants to be on the podium every week, but being yeah. in the top five mm-hmm. and that shows, look at how consistent he's been and look where he is in points. We'll get into that points battle a little bit down the stretch here, but man, just being in the top five is, is such a great place to be. This next guy would tell us the same thing. Nick Janusa goes five, five for sixth. He kind of uh, on the internet was like, man, how can you go five, five for six? How does that happen? We know Nick wasn't happy about that, but that kind of shows like, man, top fives are, are a notable thing. And I know, like I said, Nick Janusa is not happy with that math Casey, but he's another guy. He was, he impressed me all day. Qualifying was good 
good. Five, five in the motos is good. And honestly, like the sixth overall stinks, but sixth overall isn't indicative of the points you get. He got five, five, uh, a five, five points day. He's got to make up some points if he wants to put it in the top five again, like he has every other season of his career. But honestly, that's another guy. He wants more, I'm sure. But Nick Janusa, five, five in the day. That's pretty darn solid. Yeah. Good day for Nick. His riding was good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, he, he was coming with Bryce in the first or in the second moto. And honestly, I thought he was going to stay closer to Bryce and possibly be a guy that would shuffle it even more with Brandon Hogue. But it, it seemed about three quarters of the way through the moto, maybe a little less than that. It, it, I don't want to say his riding went flat because it sounds bad, but it was like the aggression sort of mellowed and it was, trying not to get myself in trouble here. Like mm-hmm. yep. it wasn't tired. Like we know Nick don't get tired. He usually picks the pace up mm-hmm. late in the moto and it, that extra click that he does late in the moto. I didn't see it come out in the second moto. Maybe that's Got the it. best way to put it. Got it. Um, but still not a, again, like I, I'm not mad at his day at all. I mean, Dude, five, qualifying, five five yeah, five qualifying better than he has most of this year. Um, putting, putting in solid results and he's in the mix of the race where honestly he could have been third or he could have been seventh. You know, those guys are just gnarly right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's everyone so in that, in that, in that group is, is super good and super aggressive. And so, for me, I think the outlook for Nick is good. He's building. You know, I'm sitting there looking at the points right now, and you can just kind of see the results on what it's what he's doing and and where he's – it's just getting better and better as yes. the season goes on. Yeah, yeah, he's trending upward for sure. <laughs> uh, Brandon Hogue would end up seventh overall, which isn't too shabby considering going up in smoke on the final lap of Moto1. I mm-hmm. uh, followed that up with that hard-fought fourth in Moto2, so seventh overall for Brandon Hogue. Casey, this guy freaking slayed it. Patrick Torini goes 8-9 for eighth overall. The Italian is the real deal. <laughs> I, I'm so impressed. He – almost for me – uh, he kind of laid low all day, and all of a sudden, I'm like, holy sh**. Like, Patrick Torini, yeah. eighth overall, he actually won that tier in fantasy. And, man, like, how impressive was that? I don't know that I would have picked, you know, uh, um, you know, not necessarily natural terrain track, like a more man-made racetrack with big booter jumps and stuff like that. I don't know if that's the track I would have picked for Patrick Torini to, you know, kind of show his best so far this season. But like I said, he's the real deal. That kid, man, what he's doing, traveling back and forth. We touched on that on these shows to come and race tracks he's never been to before and slay it the way he did this past weekend, man. He's just finding his footing. He's getting better every weekend. So impressed with Patrick Torino. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, talking with Sergio, his mechanic and and talking with Patrick, that, that track, they, he said, as soon as they walked the track that he felt right at home, it's, okay. it's very similar. It's actually similar, similar style track to what we're going to be racing on for Quad Cross the Nations. Got it. And so I think his comfort level was there and that's what we've seen go on for him. I mean, he just, he rolled right out, you know, initially and he got a good start first moto, which helped him a bunch. And he, yeah, he, he was one of the guys. I mean, he was rolling out really well. Um, jump Bigfoot, no problem. I, you know, I said him even hit it on like the parade lap. So I, he's not one of those guys. He's not nervous about big jumps at all. He he goes out there and sends it. So yeah, awesome day for Patrick. You know, knocking out a, a eighth overall. I think you know he's another guy that you're kind of seeing. You know, he been you know I, there's a lot of tents here, <clears throat> a couple fifteenths, just from some goofy stuff that probably went on with him. But you can kind of see. I think we're going to see the same sort of deal from him coming into Pleasure Valley. That tracks in the suit of style, the hard pack clay you know, choppy stuff is what I think he's used to riding there in Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I guess I wouldn't have thought that ahead of time, but man, he freaking slayed it. So credit to him. Uh, awesome to just have him on the, on the tour here in the, in the title hunt and uh, in the championship here in the States. It's awesome to see. So uh, eighth overall for Patrick Trini, ninth overall goes to Logan Stanfield. Good solid points day for him. He's now eighth in points, which is super impressive. Zach Decker ends up 10th overall in the day. He goes six, 
12 for 10th overall. So that six stands out. Like I said earlier, uh, he would have been better, but he, uh, he didn't get a good start in Moto2 and then ended up flipping while battling with Torini. And, and that's all uh, she wrote there. He actually crashed twice in the second moto. He crashed on the start. Oh, really? Oh, really? Okay. Right after the start, the second corner, he went flipping in that corner. Okay. And then was working his way back through and was trying to make a pass or had just made a pass on Torini or something. And then they, those two came together and Zach flipped again. And that's in the, his handlebars were all smashed down. I think the start button was broke off. It, it uh, went, went really sideways there right at the end of the moto. I think they ended up almost have to push the bike back. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I knew he came from the back. So that does make sense. Cause I knew he was a long way back at the start of that thing. So he was for, for all, all things considered, he was showing his speed again in the second moto. So uh, that's going to be a guy to watch going forward here in the late stages of this season. Zach Decker has been impressive. Uh, Cody Ford ends up 11th overall, but a good points day for him as well. He finds himself now squarely inside the top 10 in points. He's now in ninth in points. Uh, Vince Merman, a uh, local Ohio boy. I thought, uh, I thought he rode well. He ended up 12th overall. Marshall Smith finished 13th and, and Cesar Jimenez ended up 14th after a gnarly kind of get off and qualifying. I don't know if you saw rip it up films footage of that Casey, but uh, he didn't even race the second moto. I don't think so. Hopefully he's okay. But man, Cesar uh, was so solid, so dependable in 2021. He, he called him a fantasy darling. You can count on him every week and it just hasn't been the same this year. It, nothing's been right for Caesar so far this year. I feel bad for him, but yeah, to see footage of that get off and qualifying, getting sideways on the big, you know, that big triple jump in the middle and, um, you know, landing and, and kind of uh, like side saddling the quad and then getting to the front and then getting smashed into the fence and all that stuff, man. Um, yeah. Caesar's just not had a good go of it this year, but hopefully he can turn it around in the late stages of this season. Yeah. I didn't get to see it in person but i seen the same video you did and i had heard about it and when when i was thumbing through social media or whatever and i seen the video and you see him leave and that thing sideways i was like for what ended up happening honestly that jump is big yeah. and like those guys are high and to be that sideways and you know to kind of get thrown from the machine but not but <laughs> still not where you're supposed to be and and yeah. to get you know smashed into the fence like that you know, that was, I'd say, like, the best case scenario for Honestly. the situation. Honestly, um, yeah. I'm not sure why he didn't race the second moto. I mean, he raced the first moto. I don't know if he was banged up or whatever it was. But, yeah, definitely not um, what he was looking to have, you know, for a day. I, I don't really know much about, you know, his program or what's going on over there with those guys or with him right now. It's uh, – He's just not having the year that I think he expected by any means. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, like I said, the, the good thing for him is he's got three more opportunities to turn this thing around, and uh, that that is all in front of him at this point. So, hopefully, he can do that. So, um, as as you heard us talk about on the last episode, Wesley Wolf is out after another surgery, and um, we lost Michael Allred, at least uh, for this round as well, Casey. Um, he had to sit out for what sounds like a gnarly get-off in the week between Walnut and Briarcliff. I'm sure you know a little bit more than I do, but I even saw some pictures of like his helmet and stuff last night. And man, it was, it was all tore up and it sounded like it was a really, like it was a really bad situation. It sounded like he got out kind of lucky. He made it really sound like it could have been a really, really bad deal. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if he was going to actually put anything out about, you know, his helmet and all that kind of stuff. Um, he did. And, you know, shout out to the fly guys. Um, that helmet took a beating and and Michael's one still here. Yeah. And two has it all still like he's, mm -hmm. he's good. I mean, he's still, um, he's not a hundred percent healthy back to normal yet. Um, I think he would, it would be cool for him to come on the show one day or something and, and he yeah. can kind of tell the story, but um, I haven't got to talk to him. I called him Thursday, you know, kind of in the evening and he had already, he was already done, kind of had his phone off and was just probably doing the family time. So he's resting up. He's going to get healed up. And I, I think the plan for him is definitely to be back, uh, whether it's Pleasure Valley or Red Bud. Not 100 percent sure yet. I'm going to spend some time with uh, Chris, his team owner this week. And, you know, it was one of the things when Chris called me and he told me what was going on. You know, it happened on a Sunday. They were at uh, Lake Sugar Tree. And I don't even think Chris knew 
like how gnarly it was until probably later that day when they, you know, and then Chris went and seen him in the hospital and seen the picture of his helmet and called me and I'm like, listen, dude, you only get one head. You only, you know, you only get one body. They were, they were still wanting to come to Briarcliff. You know, he's really in that battle for 10th, you know, yeah. ninth, 10th and points and stuff. And he, he yeah. really wants to hang, you know, his head high on the season and, and end up there. So I don't think that's going to happen for him. I think he needs to sit out a couple of races and let himself heal up. You know, he's, he's got a, a family and a job and all that kind of stuff. So I think um, it might be a couple of races before we see him, but you never know. I mean, these guys are tougher than nails, but I, I talked to Joel Thursday or Friday and Joel was right behind him when he wrecked. And Joel said it was probably the second worst crash he's ever seen. Oh my gosh. Like, cause it was in a really high speed area and just the, the way the thing caught it, he said it was bad and you can see that from the helmet so oh, yeah yeah um, you can yeah you know like i said the good thing is michael's good you know he's yeah. he's still firing on all cylinders mm -hmm. he's you know all his limbs are working he, he's good to go it's just needs a little recovery time yeah that's what's that's by far what's most important and honestly like i know how much as a racer, I know how much that points battle and stuff matters. I know how much, you know, a person wants to finish in the top 10. I mean, that was a guy, I was that guy for a lot of years. Uh, but to me, it doesn't even matter. Like Michael has been so impressive this year to think that he was in, and I hate to, you know, always kind of tie things to fantasy, but when you look at that, you know, what we call our tier three riders. So it's, it's him, it's Stanfield, it's Zach Decker, it's Cody Ford, it's Patrick Trini. He's been the best of those guys coming into this race, coming into before he missed Briarcliff. He was the best of all those guys. He was the highest guy of all those guys in points. And there was only four races left. It just shows the step that he took this year, how impressive he was. That's a guy that I was battling with in 25 plus in 2019, right? Like now to see where he got to, <laughs> to see where he got to while well, I was kind of, you know, uh, trending downward into more just having fun at the races. He was on the upward swing and to see where he got since then is so impressive. So I just want to give him a shout out, man. I love Mike. He's a killer guy and um, just so stoked to see how well he's doing. So obviously we want to see him back at the races, but just like you said, so glad that he's okay. Uh, so Pleasure Valley is next. Joel Hattrick's home, home track, home, home race. Uh, he has a 34 point advantage with just six gate drops remaining. This is almost that time when you can start to taste, sense it. Uh, if you're Joel, you can kind of sense that you know, third championship of his is kind of, you know, coming into, into focus now coming into sight, but at the same time, you don't want to change up your approach. You don't want to change up what you're doing because it's been working so perfectly to, to get him where he is now, Casey. Uh, so where do you think Joel's head is at with six motors left? I'm sure, you know, obviously, especially going to his home race, I'm sure he wants to win pleasure Valley and then maybe he can, you know, play it safe after that, or maybe even not, maybe he just wants to keep going for it. You would know better than I. Yeah, I think with Joel, it's just moto to moto right now still. You know, I I think, you know, these guys train their minds, you know, to not worry about the – I mean, to worry about the big picture. But, you know, are we going to see him take a risk that's unneeded? Probably not. But at the same time, I think he's just looking for moto wins and continue to click off those moto wins and, you know, kind of pad his points gap or, you know, He's, you're not going to see him just go out there and just bow down and be second, 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 second. You right. know, when he's got enough points, he could do it. But he's yeah. not going to be that guy. Like, I think you're going to see him go to Pleasure Valley and, you know, put in the effort to try to go 1-1 one, one there. And, you know, at that point, I think he'll a uh, 40-point lead with four motos to go. And, you know, Red Bud is another one. We've seen him beat Chad there. We've seen Chad beat him there. I think you, you go into the mindset of, just moto by moto and, and wind this thing down. And, you know, he's in an, in an awesome position. I mean, we haven't seen a points gap like this in many, many years. So I think it's status quo. Mm -hmm. They're still, still working on the machine. You know, they're still, you know, trying to make everything better. You know, the team, you know, the whole Phoenix team, they're, they're cranking every day and trying to keep it better. You know, we're Jay's been testing with Joel you know, a couple times here and there, just minor little things, not reinventing the wheel by any means, obviously, because it's working. So I, I think it's the glue is there for him just to continue to keep plugging, 
and just put it in moto wins and and not taking huge chances. Yeah, I mean, so I, I saw some comments yesterday on some of our posts on social, uh, you know, kind of calculating the points already for Joel. And Joel could get third in every moto and still win the title uh, with six motos remaining, but he's not going to do that. Like I said, he's he, it's it's always it's always too early to start calculating points. It really is. Unless yeah. we're at the last race, things never go that way. They just, they never do. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised. Joel's next overall win will be his 50th of his professional career. I wouldn't be surprised if that comes at Pleasure Valley, his home race. He always brings his best to those PA races. So uh, that'll be fun. That's to see. crazy. I know. 50. <laughs> I know. I know. It's unreal. Like a funny story. I was sitting talking with Robin Ford, Bryce, Bryce's mom, Cody's mom. Yep. And, you know, we we're talking about like Bryce being 20. You know, now he just turned 20 and, you know, where he's at and, you know, what is kind of expected and, that kind of seven is that you know we got to sit back and think about this. Chad and Joel have more race wins, over, almost overall wins, than Bryce or Max or one of those guys have gate drops in the pro class. Oh yeah, and you oh, know to yeah. see what these guys are doing, what they're capable of. You know, <clears throat> both of these two are were standouts in their amateur career, Max and Bryce, and both of them are really just jump straight into the middle class and, and enlisted themselves as front runners and, and we're seeing them develop even more and more. So just like, a, I don't know, to me, like it, it really set me back in my seat. I'm, I'm the one that said it. I'm like, wow. And then you talk about Joel with 50 overalls. Holy moly. Like these guys are insane. It's unreal. Like I said, the next one will be Joel's 50th win. And for Chad, he, you know, that with that last one he got, he's got 63. So to think of all the race wins that those guys have, uh, again, that's why they're in a category of their own. They're two of the greatest ever. They'll go down as two of the greatest ever. And just so grateful to have those guys in the series. And I think, and I said this to Brandon, and I've said this to some of the other guys, I think I said it to Robin, the stuff that that these younger kids are learning from Joel and Chad is going to have such a great trickle down effect in years to come. If these kids stick with it, it's uh, they're learning how to be the, the pros pros. We're seeing it in Brandon wanting to emulate Chad. He said it and he talked about Joel as well. And Max, you know, Max, you know, he's the understudy of Chad. We need these guys, these seeds that these legends are planting are going to be fruitful, you know, for long into the future. So uh, just awesome to see. And we got to appreciate while we have these, legends i think that uh, that goes without saying so uh the battle to watch is going to be that battle for the the top three casey we kind of touched on that already we'll tie that up bryce ford sits atop that post with uh 218 points. That's uh, where he was last year. Obviously, that's his biggest goal is to stay in the top three. He got that uh, position last year at Briarcliff, clinched that at Briarcliff last year. Jeffrey Rostrelli is just four points back. Hogue is just seven points back. And Janusa is 23 points out of third. So he's a little farther back. And then Max is 38. But this is going to be a dogfight, especially between those top three. With Bryce being, you know, in the top three spot now, Jeffrey's only four spots behind or four points behind him. And Hogue is seven points behind Bryce as well. So between those three, it's going to be a dogfight. And, you know, again, that's going to be a race for that top three spot that's going to be can't miss in these last few races that we have in this 2022 season, very similar to last year. That was the race that everyone was focused on. And that's what this is going to be like this year too. That's going to be can't miss racing between, uh, between really those three, but those five guys that are all kind of in the mix. Cause we saw last year too. And I said this to Max, you know, he might be a little ways back, but, he started making up, you know, huge chunks of points last year when he put those, those couple podiums together and, and Janusa too, he's 23 out of third, but he at least wants to be. So what would he be? He's about 15 points, 16 points out of the top five. And I think that that might be a goal for him too, is, you know, he's, I know he hates to be the top five guy, but you know, he, but, but to have been in the top five every year of your career is a big feat too. So, you know, every one of these guys is pushing for something different and it's going to be a, a can't miss race down the stretch here with three races to go. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they're, and they're all fired up. And I think, you know, everyone's in their, in the best shape they're going to be in all season right now, you know, everyone's kind of got their stuff dialed in it's it's just coming down to you know mono and mono right now these guys are gonna start putting down the heat um and every one of them wants to be in that spot 
just as bad as the next guy or, you know, they're going to say I want it more than they do or whatever it is. So it, it's going to get interesting the rest of this year. Um, you know, and we know Nick don't want to be like, oh, I'm the top five guy. But at the same time, he didn't want to be the sixth place guy. Exactly. So he's going to really try to put in that charge and, and click up some more. He's going to definitely want to make himself as good as he was last year, if not keep trying to better that. Yeah, it's going to be so fun to watch down the stretch. Uh, Casey, let's finish up with our amateur classes. And there's only one guy to start with this week covering the amateur races. Let's bring him on to talk about uh, a weekend that he won't soon forget at Briarcliff. Insurance. It's not something everyone likes to talk about. But let's face it. If you race motocross, it's something you should have. Integrative Financial Concepts is an independent financial service and insurance firm who offers moto-friendly insurance and helps out riders like Nick Janusa, Jeffrey Rastrelli, and Joel Hetrick gain confidence on the track. With their unique safe-to-race and safe-to-ride programs, if you qualify, they have the ability to offer life insurance with living benefits to those who ride. With these living benefits, you may have the ability to access a portion of your life insurance policy while you're still living for things like cancer, heart attack, stroke, or chronic illness. They can also help with many other things, such as home, auto, motorhome, and trailer insurance, as well as college planning, special needs planning, payroll processing, as well as group health benefits for your business. So whether something happens on or off the track, Integrative Financial Concepts has you covered. With their complimentary one-on-one -on -one appointments, what are you waiting for? Reach out to Mike Daniele at D-A-N-I-E-L-E -E underscore Michael at nlgroupmail.com today and see how integrated financial concepts can help you. Living benefit riders are supplemental benefits that can be added to a life insurance policy and are not suitable unless you have the need for life insurance. Riders are optional and may require additional premium and may not be available in all states or on all products. This is not a solicitation for any specific insurance policy. Just like the sport of ATV motocross as a whole, our Digging Deep community is brought together by the love for racing that we all share. Our sport is compiled of many great people and leading that charge is the Launderville family at Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply. This racing-owned family business is a steel and concrete supplier serving the entire United States. Launderville Steel is a full-service steel supplier of new and surplus steel, aluminum, and stainless steel products headlined by the 4130 chromoly tubing and plate used in the building of chassis for ATVs and UTVs, off-road truck racing, late model dirt and pro tractor pulling series, drag racing, and more. Launderville Steel loves their racing just as much as we do, but don't forget about their concrete division as well. With over 25 years of experience, the concrete division can supply everything you need to complete your next business or personal project. Their central Midwest location enables LSE to easily serve customers across the United States. For a quote, additional info, answers to more of your questions, or to talk a little racing, head over to LaundervilleSteel.com or give them a call today. We are proud to be partnered with yet another racer-owned company. Thank you, Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply. Here at Digging Deep, we have an obvious passion for ATVs and pridefully enjoy sharing the sport's history. Since 2019, when the podcast was born, we've been working to partner with individuals who share our passion, but one man and his vision had been missing from our partnership group. Until now. When it comes to the sport's history, the hallowed grounds of Binky's Forever ATC Museum has it all. Binky Tapscott's mind-blowing collection of three- and four-wheelers has preserved history by spanning all makes and models from Honda three-wheelers in chronological order to unique builds that shaped ATV racing as we know it, like Doug Gust's iconic DRZ-powered hybrid thumper and everything in between. There's no denying Binky's passion, a passion that we certainly relate to here at Digging Deep. Binky's goal is to share his amazing collection with fellow enthusiasts by making his prized possessions accessible to the public via scheduled visits. Follow Forever ATC Museum on Facebook and watch foreveratc.com for further updates on possibly getting a chance to see Binky's Forever ATC Museum for yourself. We are proud to welcome Binky's Forever ATC Museum to the Digging Deep family. We recite on every Digging Deep episode that we are all about aligning with others who share our passion and love for ATVs. And that's exactly what Blends All is. For more than 60 years, Blends All Racing Oil has been the secret choice of many championship winning riders and engine builders. From world championship kart racing in Europe to California speedway racing or the mud and rocks of East Coast cross country racing, thousands of hardcore racers know that nothing out lubricates or outperforms Blends All. Even with Blends All's wide reach into all forms of racing, Blends All's lead man David Schloss admits that ATV riders are his people. 
In fact, he's been an ATV enthusiast since 1986 when he first threw a leg over a Suzuki Quad Sport 230. Fun fact, his passion for ATV racing even led him to launch a popular ATV racing magazine in the mid-2000s called ATV Insider. So Blenzall is a small family-owned business that blends and bottles all of its products in Ohio and has ATV roots? Sign us up. That's why Blenzall is the oil choice of the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast. To learn more about Blenzall's rich heritage or to shop Blenzall's full line of 2T and 4T racing lubricants, visit Blenzall.com and follow them at Blenzall on Instagram. Evans Waterless Power Sports Coolant. The best power sports coolant on the market, Evans prevents overheating and boil over so you need not worry about harming your engine or suffering a premature end to your ride no matter what the conditions. Designed for use in ATVs, UTVs, motorcycles, and other power sports equipment, when conditions are at their worst, Evans is at its best. Upgrade to Evans now to avoid overheating and boil over next time you hit the track or trail. Use discount code DIGGINGDEEP20 at checkout to save at EvansCoolant.com. Thanks for listening, and remember to support our partners. Now back to the show. All right, guys, our final guest tonight put on an absolute clinic in the sports fastest amateur classes at Briarcliff, brought to you by our friends at Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply, your go-to full-service steel supplier of new and surplus steel, aluminum, and stainless steel products. Welcome back, friend of the show, and overall winner of both Pro-Am and Pro-Sport in Ohio. Say hello to Mr. Aaron Salinas. What's up, Aaron? Welcome back to the show. Uh, how's it going, Cody? Thanks for having me. So we say around here, if you go out and ball on the weekend, you'll get the call to come on digging deep. And man, did you ever ball out overall wins in both pro-am and pro sport. And much like I said to your buddy, Max Linquist, you looked like a totally different rider at Briarcliff. So what was different? Uh, so I was actually able to ride in between uh, uh, that round. And uh, that definitely helped out a lot. Like where I'm from, there's nowhere to ride near me unless I go like five and a half hours. So it's hard. I, I can only really do like off the bike training. So I had uh, gone back with Max Linquist to Wisconsin. Uh, yeah. We yeah. took like a day off and then we, we rode at his place on the stalkers. That was a blast. And then uh, JJ and uh, his dad had invited us to go out there and ride. So that was, that was all honestly sweet. So we rode there twice and then uh, Max's place we rode uh, a lot. So sure. all that sure. ride definitely helped out a lot. Like just my intensity and all of it. So. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. And yeah, whatever you and Max were doing obviously worked uh, on the weekend when you guys went to went to Briarcliff. So let's break down the weekend. We'll break it in half so you can tell us about it kind of uh, piece by piece. So on Saturday in Pro Sport, you go out 1-3 for the overall win there. So in Moto 1, you led wire to wire. You never cracked while being pressured by Brett Musig and Dane Molander there in the first Moto. And then in Moto 2, you battled all the way up to third, which I'm sure you knew was good enough to take the overall win for the day. Uh, so tell me about uh, that pro sport win on Saturday there for you. Oh, it, it was awesome to get the first like overall out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I knew I needed to step up my game, you know, coming like into the last few rounds. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first moto, I mean, like you said, uh, led it all the way. So that was that was awesome even though I had the pressure from those guys, man, everyone's so fast. It's, it's hard to not make any mistakes with all those guys behind you. Well, in, in the, like you said, those classes are so fast, but then like when you look at the interval and you see, I mean, you were, you had somebody basically there, you know, you knew they were there the whole time and like very similar to what we talked about with Max. I mean, there's, that's, that's a lot to think about and process as a racer to kind of put that to bed and just do your own thing. So to do that for a whole model like that, like that's, that's impressive. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, it's like that every, it's been like that every round there's, I mean, we're all pretty <laughs> close to the same speed. So it's just like an all out, whoever can't, doesn't make a mistake. You, you kind of, uh -huh. you kind of, so. Exactly. So then tell me about the second moto. Oh uh, yeah. Second moto. I actually had a terrible start. I think I, uh, I looked at my mom's video that she had showed me and I, I came out ninth and then like one of the first corners, like, uh, everyone was like hugging an inside Okay. And I just railed the outside and passed a few people right there. And then I had to make a few passes on the first lap. And then I made a pretty sweet pass. Like, I don't know what lap it was, but uh, okay. to pass both Tino and, and JJ in the same corner. So that was, that was sick. And I ended up in third and I was just, I kind of knew I had to stay smart. Did you know you had the win at that point? Well, actually, uh, I, I knew like where everything would have standed. Where, okay. Like, 
Brett would have won if he would have stayed in first, but uh, right. Chambers ended up getting him on the last lap. So, yeah. <laughs> so it worked out. It worked, it worked out. out. Yeah, I got pretty lucky, but I'll take it. <laughs> Oh. Uh, that's crazy um and then yeah so so if the weekend would have ended there it would have been a great weekend right but uh you heard they were running a two for one special you cash in on that deal uh, winning on sunday as well this time in pro-am and there was you know actually a lot of parallels between the two days you go two one for first overall in pro-am you went one three for the overall in the other class uh moto one you led wire to wire again with pressure from from another rider this time it was chambers throughout uh but you were you know you never succumbed to the pressure much like max linquist actually never cracking now that i think about it in that first moto of his and then you lead the majority of moto two but i'm sure again like i guess last time was a little different but maybe you were aware in that second moto uh, that you didn't necessarily need to win to take the overall there over dane molander for the overall so tell me about sunday i feel like that's almost more of your focus probably at this point is pro-am so tell me about sunday yeah, I'd say pro is more of my focus just because uh, pro sport, it's, there's so many guys. There's like, I've had a few crashes and then like mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah. so Pro-Am, uh, first moto, got the start and led the whole race. I had the pressure of Chambers, like you said. And uh, yeah, just didn't didn't crack under the pressure. Tried my best. And uh, then second moto, I came out, got the start again. I was like, oh, let's go. Like, starts to make it so much easier oh yeah and uh so then i just tried to put on a charge like in the beginning and actually that i was like i was just thinking about it way too much kind of got like tight i got pretty tight trying to like pull away a little bit sure so and uh i was just trying to pull away and then timmy i'd seen that timmy had wrote on the tip on the pit board uh dane minus three so I was like, he's minus three seconds. I knew that if Dane were to win and I get second, I would get the overall. So sure. I kind of like relaxed a little bit and uh, looked and I saw Chambers in fourth. So I was kind of just, I kind of like cruised out a little bit and mm-hmm. relaxed. So yeah, That's yeah, cool. road smart. That makes total sense to me. So do you approach the races, like do you approach Pro-Am any different knowing that, you know, those are longer motos? Like, I mean, they're almost like twice as long probably as Pro Sport ends up being. So do you approach Pro-Am any different or is it really just the same? The class is so fast. You just got to try to go as fast as you can for as long as you can. Yeah, I, I say I do it the same, but like that second moto, I just been thinking about it too much. Just it was my first ever overall. In Pro-Am. Yeah. Yeah, so like of course. I had one moto, like, but never an overall. So I was uh-huh. just all up in my head. But now I got that <laughs> one out of the way, so I'm excited to see where the other ones, how the other ones go. That's awesome. I mean, you know, this is something that we talk about all the time on these shows, but you know, as soon as you get like that first taste, now it's, now it becomes expected. Right. So, um, so, and I feel like that's an advantage for a rider too. You know, it's almost like you expect that for yourself. So you are just subconsciously willing to push a little harder. So uh, with overall wins in both pro-am and pro sport, it's hard to imagine Aaron that you could really have a better weekend than you just had. So you're probably, uh, you know, shooting pretty high with the races going forward, trying to replicate this thing. Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely gonna, especially after you know riding all that much, I'm gonna try and mm-hmm. do what I can to ride here. I'm gonna try, but we'll see. I'm I'm gonna work off the bike, so okay. I want to do it again. I want to continue and uh, like championship wise, that's that's what I'm looking forward to is pro mm-hmm. So that's exactly right. So I was going to say pro-am has to be the focus for you. Like I touched on earlier, because you're only four points out of the lead in that class with three rounds remaining. And uh, I mean, that's, it's right there, right? It's right in front of you. Whoever grabs the the reins on this thing is going to win this title. And as a racer, that's exactly where you want to be. So you got to be stoked on that. Oh yeah. No, I'll take it. I, I just, I hadn't won any, but I had been staying consistent. So uh-huh. I'm going to try and keep, keep on. So. And we'll Aaron, see. I mean, yeah, the crazy part, this is the crazy part to me. So I remember asking whoever, I mean, Casey and some of these guys that we had on the preseason shows, I remember asking them, you know, what's happening with Aaron Salinas? Like, I felt like there was really no buzz. There was no hype. There was no real updates, right? Because, I mean, in the offseason, we're kind of, you know, relying on you guys, like as riders to know what's going on. So I don't know what the plan was for your season. Little did I know you were just keeping a low profile and you were ready to come out like a silent assassin and slay it when the racing started. So yeah, like, I don't know. Like, I remember thinking, man, if Salinas is going to be at all the races, like, you know, he's going to be up in the mix. Obviously, he's going to be one to watch. But it was almost like you came into the season quiet, at least from my point of view. And and now here you are with, like I said, everything right in front of you. No, yeah. Uh, 
Well, I'm I, I uh, I'm actually going to college at Texas A&M, mm-hmm. so yep. that kind of had me pretty busy. I didn't really get to ride much mm-hmm. until uh, the last like two weeks. Max came to Texas and we rode, and uh, really, I, I'm being totally honest. Like those two weeks, I I I was coming into Texas and I was ready to get beat up on like bad. <laughs> Okay. So, and then I ended up winning one of the motos. So like, it was just like a crazy, crazy thing how it all like ended up. But yeah, I've been doing, uh, trying to juggle college and, and racing and all of it, but it's, it's been working out so far. So I'll take it. It's, it's funny. I asked the question. I knew exactly what you were going to say because I knew that you're a college student at Texas A&M, but explain to people what it's like to juggle that crazy college schedule while racing at the peak of our sport. You're racing and competing and winning in the top amateur classes. You know, I've been there before. I've had to, you know, juggle the college thing before while racing as a pro and stuff, but um, a focused and dedicated person can navigate all that. And you're proving that right in front of our eyes. But I feel like I truly feel like when you succeed that way, you know, you're still going to school, you're still taking care of all that stuff. And then you succeed on the racetrack too. I feel like it's almost that much more rewarding because you're not giving up schooling and giving up, you know, stuff that's so important, right? And just to race and vice versa, you're not giving up anything and you're being successful both ways. Like that's a special thing. It takes a special person to be able to do that. So credit to you for that, but tell people what it's like to juggle all that because it's not easy. I'm sure it's not. Oh, no, definitely not. Especially like, I remember like the first round of finals comes around. It's like, oh, gosh, I can't, you know, it's like full on study this study that. And uh, no, it's it's a whole lot to juggle. That's why I'm saying like, I really didn't know where I was gonna, gonna mm-hmm. stand in like this field, especially all these guys are going to Deckers and going all these places and riding them like I'm in such a like, deficit in a way, riding wise, but I was actually uh I was actually in the gym all the time uh, Mm -hmm. while going to college because, I mean, I only had classes every, like, it's not all throughout the day. Of course, yes. So I'd go to the gym. I'd have a lot of time to do that. And it's paying off, I guess. Yeah, you do the best you can. And it's funny, like, it's almost like, like, heck yeah, like I beat those guys and I didn't go to Deckers. I didn't do all those. I didn't have those advantages that they maybe had. And and it's funny. I don't know if you're a guy that ever felt pressure through up coming up through your racing career or whatever, but I think that changes some when, you know, you, you got, you know, the pressure of like finals and the pressure of school and the pressure of wanting to keep good grades and, and stuff like that. When you have that pressure, it's almost like, man, like, the racing, I don't feel, I don't feel as much pressure racing. I don't even put that much pressure on myself racing because like, that's my vice now. Like that's, that's what I just enjoy to do. Like, thank God I get to go to the races and ride my four wheeler. And I don't know if that, that is how you feel at all, but that's how always how I felt. It was like, man, I put a lot of pressure on myself for finals. I put a lot of pressure on myself for school. And you know, when the racing comes around, then it's like, man, let's just go enjoy this. And that's when a rider's most successful anyway. No, yeah, it's funny you say that because, like, now that I think about it, like, uh, so, like, this year, I was, like I said, I didn't really know what to expect, and uh, Mm -hmm. I was coming in, I didn't have, like, any pressure, just because I was, like, I'm, I'm going to college, like, I, I have, like, an excuse in a way, right, but, so I had no pressure, and, and then Texas comes around, and, and I, like, I had like the most fun I'd had in forever. So I just feel like this year I've just been having the most fun. And I think that's, what's making me faster. And I feel like I've matured a little bit in a way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's helped a lot. And uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy that you say that because I, yeah. The more you let yourself enjoy it, the less pressure you put on yourself. Like obviously everybody, you know, wants to win and wants to make everybody, you know, around them that supports them and everything proud. And you want to do right by the people that are around you, but no doubt in my mind, the, the more you enjoy it, the more you love the process, the more you just let yourself go do your thing and enjoy what you're doing and love riding your four wheeler, the more successful a a person is. So I think that that's something that everybody can take away from this interview, but uh, Aaron, man, I love it. Uh, Congrats 
congrats on a stellar weekend. Awesome to see what you did this weekend. Like I told you, uh, there was no way to cover the amateur racing or the racing in general from Briarcliff without talking to you because you absolutely slayed it. I can't thank you enough for jumping on here with us to talk about it. And uh, good luck the rest of the way. This is going to be an awesome battle to watch down the stretch for, for this Pro-Am title. So maybe give us your thoughts as you're kind of looking at these last three races. How do you feel about the last three races on the schedule here? And you do have a little bit of a break now. You said that maybe riding down there isn't the easiest thing, but you can kind of get everything in line and get your bearings before, you know, this last three race stretch. That's got to be a good feeling at least. Oh yeah, for sure. So I'll, I'll probably uh, go and ride in Houston. I'm probably going to take this week off and then go ride in Houston next week and okay. figure all that stuff out. And then uh, maybe even try and go hang out with Max Linquist again, because it seemed to work out after, uh, after Pleasure Valley. So <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I need to do what I did this weekend at the rest of the races if I want a, a good shot at it. So all these guys, all these guys are no jokes. So whoever wins it deserves it. And it's it's going to be what it's going to be. So, yeah, well, I think that that dude, that's the, that's the right uh, mentality to have, but yes, there's something in the water up here with these Wisconsin guys. They're really, they're really, uh, you know, JJ has been good and, and Max is killing it. There's a lot of, a uh, lot of, a lot of good guys coming out of here in Wisconsin. So um, hopefully you, you do get up here and hopefully you keep slaying it on the weekend, pal. It's awesome to see. And I do really appreciate you coming on here to chat about it. Uh, just so proud of you. Awesome. I, I remember telling people and telling you, I think what an awesome conversation we had last time you joined the show. You're somebody that I obviously have been cheering for ever since you made me such a fan and I uh, just appreciate you being on here and look, looking forward to doing this again, pal. Oh, thank you so much, Cody. Appreciate the opportunity. You're the man that's pro am and pro sport winner from Briarcliff, Aaron Salinas right here on the digging deep ATBMX podcast brought to you by Launderville steel enterprises and concrete supply. See you soon, pal. See you, Cody. Appreciate it. All right, back here one final time with Casey Greek on the Digging Deep ATMX podcast, finishing our coverage of round seven with our amateur classes. And we heard from Aaron Salinas there. He absolutely killed it, taking the overall win, both pro-am and pro-sport. Casey, how impressive was Aaron this weekend? Yeah, Aaron was like a new kid this weekend. I mean, Aaron's been good all season, but he just, he came out firing. He got to ride a little bit more in between rounds this time. And I think that was one of the things that he needed the most was just some seat time. And, you know, he got to spend some time with Max. And I think Dane was up there. There's a, you know, good group of guys that went to Launderville's and rode at Launderville's. And it, it obviously showed in Aaron this weekend. He was he was on it. And he rode really well the entire, entire weekend. I mean, his starts were on point. His speed was good. And, you know, he he had it figured out. I mean, we've seen, you know, something that stood out a bunch was the second Pro-Am moto. Dane, bad start, buried in the back of the pack type of thing, worked his way all the way up to first to win the moto. So, I mean, hats off to Dane. That was an impressive ride. Ran some of his best lap times at the end of the race. At the same time, Aaron, Aaron knew where Dane finished the first moto. And he didn't have to beat him to win the overall. And I think for Aaron, it was standing on top of that podium in both of the pro sport pro-am classes this weekend was the most important thing that he needed. And I think that's going to be something that's going to light the fire for Aaron the rest of the season. Yeah, I think so too. That's going to be another fun points battle to watch down the stretch here in pro-am. But yeah, there was some crazy like like I said, topsy turvy mixing up going on in those races. So in pro am, Dane Molander and Joseph Chambers joined Aaron Salinas on the podium. Uh, Salinas is just four points back of Molander at the top of the standings there in pro am. And Salinas beat out Musig and Chambers for the overall in pro sport, but Brett. Uh, Brett Music has a 35 point lead in that one. So uh, that title's probably all but over. Um, so let me, uh, let me kind of finish my little bit of amateur notes here and then I'll let you take it from there, Casey. So we heard from Jeremy uh, Osborne earlier, his daughter, Kinsey grabbed another win in both WMX and the women's 15 plus class. And she went eight, four for seventh overall and four fifty B against the boys. So that's so rad. And uh, this WMX title is nearly hers, Casey. I can't believe that. So I'll let you take it from there. Uh, we can kind of tie up all the amateur coverage. I'll let you take it the rest of the way on our amateur coverage. Casey, who stood out to you this weekend? Yeah, I think, I mean, you can't go without saying Kinsey's name. I mean, she she was on it. She was rolling out all weekend. You know, Andrea had, you know, I I felt like Andrea had a good day, but I know she was a little hard on herself about some things. Um, one, one person I wanted to mention paper-wise that didn't come out very good 
but um, riding wise, was he in Juca in in pro am on Sunday? I mean, he was he was up there battling with those guys, and he ended up cracking a head pipe. And so he he kind of went back. He ended up set sixth overall on the day, but his riding was really really good. Uh, Natalie Jackson, another one that you know put in an impressive day. Um, Adam Ulrich, he was rolling really well in a tip over in the first moto pro am. You know, really hurt hurt his day more or less, and then I, I can't remember what ended up happening in the second moto, and then obviously Joey Chambers. We talked about him, you know, this is a kid that doesn't get enough credit. I think a lot of times he kind of flies under the radar. He's not like the flashiest guy or has, you know, always in the mix of everyone, but he's always in the mix for the overall in both those classes. So um, very impressive weekend for him and podiums, I think in both um, speed wise, the kid's incredible. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it looked like uh, just looked like a lot of great racing going on in those classes. Uh, big numbers, big classes, a lot of battles. It seems like uh, we always see great racing at Briarcliff. So i um, always happy to touch on the amateur racing there. But Casey, uh, I don't have anything more. Uh, we kind of rely on you for these races that I'm not at for the amateur stuff. So um, if you don't have anything else, um, you know, I think that uh, that'll wrap it up for us. Good deal. Yeah. Um... I didn't have a lot of time to watch a lot of the amateur races this weekend. I was kind of put putting the wood down all weekend, trying to keep everyone rolling. And so I don't have a huge amount, but I, I appreciate having me like always. And, you know, I look forward to the next one. And I hope to see everyone back out. You know, we get to Pleasure Valley, 4th of July weekend. I think it's going to be impressive. It's going to be a good time. Hey, how excited are you to have an extra week off, Casey? Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> like, and, and I hate to say it because we used to do this all the time. And, and once the COVID thing happened in 2020, we got used to having bigger breaks in between. And, uh, you know, my schedule is pretty, pretty crazy. You know, I, I go to all the motocross races. Plus, you know, I don't live real close to the shop. So I travel a bunch and it, I'm really excited to have a couple weeks here to kind of reset my gears. I was feeling pretty burnt and kind of drug in multiple way, different directions. And I think this is going to allow me to get some stuff caught up at the shop and it, it's just going to be good. So I have to say thank you to Racer Productions and the, the whole ATV and Mets crew over there for giving us an extra weekend off. Yeah. I feel like you and everybody else involved in the series <laughs> needs to get caught up a little bit. So, well, um, and it's, you know, in years past we've done this, but you could get stuff right now exactly now we can't get stuff right now and so it makes it even more and as much as everyone knows that they don't always understand that <laughs> no, they and don't. so that even wears on you more where you're just like mm -hmm. you know i'm waving the white flag over here like help <laughs> so i'm yeah. excited to have a couple of weeks and get to spend some good time with the family and and kind of reset the bearings for the second the second go around of the series yeah well casey i uh, always appreciate your time here love all the insight that you offer us here on the show enjoy a little extra time off between races here and for us uh i'm cody jansen that's casey greek that's a wrap for our Briarcliff coverage with casey greek brought to you by did I, you weren't brought to you by Manscaped. I didn't change this. I don't uh, remember. <laughs> so I'm going to say that again. That's a wrap for our Briarcliff coverage with Casey Greek, brought to you by Evans Waterless Power Sports Coolant. Use discount code DIGGINGDEEP20 at evanscoolant.com. Casey, thanks so much, and we'll talk to you again soon. I can't lie. I'm looking forward to the extra week off as well. Looking forward to hitting the track with my new Yamaha YFZ 450R build. And then we're going to do a podcast or two discussing this Blue Crew build of mine. So be on the lookout for that for those of you who are interested. Major thanks to tonight's guests, Jeremy Osborne, Max Lindquist, Aaron Salinas, and Casey Greek. Thanks to producer Dallas Jansen, my brother, for all his hard work. Thanks to Brooke and AMA official Harv Whipple. Thanks to all of our donors. You know who you are. We appreciate you so much. Thanks to all of our partners, CSD Tires. Go to shop.csdtires.com today. Yamaha, thanks to Blue Crew. Thanks to SSI Decals, DID Racing Chain, Namira Technologies, Bronco ATV and UTV Components, Impact Solutions, Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply, the financial advice of the Haymar Financial Group, Forworks Carbon, DP Brakes, Factory 43, Integrated Financial Concepts and their Safe to Race and Safe to Ride Insurance Programs, Binky's Forever ATC Museum, Blends All Oil, the official oil choice of digging deep, 
Evans Waterless Power Sports Coolant, Walsh Racecraft, and Manscaped. Get 20% off and free shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. Support the brands that support our show, and don't forget to use those codes to save. Find it all on our website, and be sure to click those Rocky Mountain ATVMC and Amazon banners for all your gear and parts needs, everyday needs, and to help us out. And most of all, thanks to you guys for listening. Our show merchandise, including our Can't Win Tees, is all available at shop.diggingdeepatvmx.com. So check that out, and we have something brand new on the way. What I think is the raddest item of clothing that we've put out yet, so be on the lookout for that. It's just about ready to be released. If you're looking for another easy way to help support us, visit our website and click the Patreon or Buy Me a Coffee buttons. This allows you to set up a one-time or monthly contribution to support our efforts. You can give us a call using our voicemail line. Give us your reaction to the show, the races, and or everything in between so we can play them on the show and react to what you have to say. The number is 920-569-3519. We want to hear from you, so give us a call. Follow the show on social media, Digging Deep ATVMX Podcast, and myself, Cody Jansen, for additional content, coverage, and more fun stuff as this 2022 season hits its stretch run. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. Wherever you find podcasts, you'll find the Digging Deep ATVMX Podcast. All episodes, additional podcast providers, sponsor links and discount codes, show merchandise, fantasy info, and more can all be found on our website, diggingdeepatvmx.com, so check that out today. Shout out to our one and only Digging Deep ATVMX fantasy winner from Briarcliff, a repeat winner this season, Albert McPherson. Congrats, Uncle Al. Less than 2% of players had Max Linquist, and less than 1% had Patrick Cherini and you somehow had them both, sir. So congrats on a well-deserved win. I'll just be over here sporting my I Can't Win Digging Deep ATVMX Fantasy shirt, so don't mind me. Be a friend, tell a friend. Please download, subscribe, rate, review, and share. And with that, for Jeremy Osborne, Max Lindquist, Aaron Salinas, Casey Greek, Brooke Catherine, Dallas Jansen, and I'm your host, Cody Jansen. Thanks for listening to and making us the number one podcast in ATV racing with over 161,000 downloads last month and 88 total countries. Until next time, thanks for joining us in digging deep with the stars of ATV Motocross. Things are crashing and burning here at the Digging Deep Podcast, much like the Titanic. Those guys were hauling ass, for real. I remember watching Doug Gus, I don't know who it was, Steel City, running the same times Friday afternoon as James Stewart was on Sunday back then. It was mental. I've never seen quads go that fast. Quad are freaking nice.